morning, everybody. Welcome to the Bath and Wolsey Somerset Planning Committee on 6th of April. My name's Councillor Sue Craig, I'm chair of the committee. Please can I remind everyone to switch their phones and iPads to silent so we don't get any musical interruptions. Um, the meeting is being filmed. The recording will be available on the council's website. Anyone speaking that does not wish to be filmed, please could you let our support team know down in the bottom corner. Thank you. I will now uh, pass across to our new Democratic Services Officer, welcome Karina, um, to read out the emergency evacuation procedure. Thank you, Chair. If the continuous alarm sounds, you must evacuate the building and proceed to the named assembly point. From this room, you need to follow the green running person sign to the exit using either the main staircase or the stone staircase at the, this end of the room. Please do not use the lifts. Arrangements are in place for the safe evacuation of disabled people. The assembly point for this building is at the Orange Grove grassed area opposite Bath Abbey. Thank you very much, and I will now go back to the Democratic Services Officer to give details of any apologies for absence and substitutions today. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, apologies from Councillor Vic Clark and Councillor Brian Simmons is substituting. Thank you. And item three, could we have any declarations of interest today, please? I didn't know I was going to be at this meeting, and I already sat on a town council planning committee on the two items that have been before this council so i will speak and leave the room i want to speak to could you so tell me which items those are okay. please sorry which items i've got two two cases in my ward that i would like to speak to on this agenda item four and, and seven the room, not vote. so so you'll be speaking from the front and then leaving the committee Thank you very much. Anybody else? Oh, my goodness. Uh, right, Councillor McPhee. Um, I'm acquainted with the uh, applicant of Durley Grange, but I don't think it will affect my ability to make a judgment. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hounsell. Uh, thank you. Um, many years ago, uh, um, I'm, I'm referring to... Uh, Dirty Grange, uh, the applicant Dr. Roberts. Many years ago, uh, his daughter Larissa was a Baines Lib Dem councillor, and also his late wife was a Lib Dem town councillor. Uh, but um, uh, I don't think that affects uh, my judgment at all. Um, what I'm talking about is many years ago. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Hounsell. Uh, Councillor Hodge, did you have your? Will you be leaving the committee for the final item on the agenda? Yes, sorry, the final item relates to um, an application for myself for tree work. No, I won't, I'll be standing down for that, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Right, goodness, that was a flurry. Any, any more from anybody? No? Lovely, thank you very much. Um, item four, urgent business agreed by the chair. And I, there is no urgent business today. Um, Item five, I'll pass to our Democratic Services Officer again to inform you of the public speaking procedure. Thank you. Uh, speakers will be called to speak immediately after the case officer has made their presentation about the application. The order of speakers and the time allowed for speaking will be as follows. First, uh, parish town council representatives will speak and will be allowed three minutes in total. Second, objectors to an application will be allowed three minutes in total. Then supporters of an application will be allowed three minutes in total. If there is more than one objector or supporter of an application, they must share the three minutes allowed to each side. As there are two associated applications for the first um, agenda item, there will be a total of six minutes for both objectors and supporters. Uh, Finally, the ward councillors not on the committee who have indicated that they wish to speak about an application may do so for a maximum of five minutes. Well, that would be 10 minutes for the combined first item. Speeches will be timed by the traffic light system you can see on the table next to me. At the start, the light will be green and then will turn to amber when there is one minute of speaking time remaining. When the light turns red, speakers should immediately conclude their remarks. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, minutes from last meeting, they have been circulated. Can I ask if anyone has any comments? And if not, can we have someone to approve them, please? Councillor Davis. Happy to recommend that they're approved. Happy to recommend that. Can I have a second? Councillor Jackson. Thank you. I'll all sign those in a minute. Great. Uh, so we're on to the uh, first item this morning. We're going to be dealing with the site visit list from the last meeting. Uh, the first one we're looking at today, um, Manor House in Cainsham, is in fact a full and an LBA. So there are two. There will be two votes at the end of this, but we'll, we'll, all of the debate and the presentation will cover both items. So if I could invite the case officer Dominic Patrick to present his report when he's ready, please. Thank you, Chair. So uh, v v this, uh, this is a dual application for full application listed building consent at uh, Manor House, Waterloo Lane, Burnett, for uh, the installation of solar panels and a ground source heat pump uh, uh, and associated um, pipe work um, to connect to the, uh, the main house within the basement. As before, uh, this is on, a, on the left. You've got the um, the block plan of the cartilage of, of the uh, of a property of red, the residential cartilage, and on the on the right, you can see a, um, a zoomed out location plan with the red line um, indicating the um, the extent of the, um, the the estate, which includes the uh, the parkland to the north and the east. This, this plan here uh, shows the list of buildings, which includes uh, the Man House itself and the adjacent St. Michael's Church, both which are grade, uh, grade two listed. This plan here is, uh, uh, sh shows the extent of tree coverage within, within the park. Again, a, a zoomed in location plan indicating the extent of the of, of, of the uh, of a property and in the top right corner you can see the the, the compound for the proposed solar PV panels this plan here shows a layout of the proposed panels so you've got the, the pair of um, solar PV panels here uh, the perimeter fence and just beyond it you've got the there's a screen hedging. You've got a top-down view here and then a section here at the bottom right. Again, sort of closer sections and elevations of the proposed fenced and hedging. The, uh, just to clarify, the, the, um, the fence is um, 2.4 metres high. Um, the hedge um, is shown to, ex to, um, to exceed that um, up to uh, this hedge here, which is uh, three metres high. Up to three metres high. We've got the um, existing and proposed basement plan for the proposed plant equipment. Um, as you can see, very little distur disturbance to historic fabric. And again, the, the proposed uh, elevations of, of Man House itself, um, the, the pipe work is to be um, installed underground to connect to the field, so there will be no impact on the immediate curtilage of the listed building. And an aerial, f aerial, Im aerial image here, which shows the extent of um, tree coverage surrounding the curtilage of Manor House and the adjacent church, and you can see sort of a more open, open land here within within the parkland, and various trees um, are spread out within the land. The uh, solar solar PV array would be is to be installed um, in here in this location in the top right corner, which would require the removal of one tree. Now I've got photographs. Uh, these, the top left is again a photograph um, facing towards the uh, manor house, and in the top right so you've got the uh, the view roughly within the location of the of the of the 
solar PV compound facing the adjacent property of Whitson Lodge. And various other photographs taken from the highway, the adjacent highway towards the site. And this is from the southeast corner. And finally, I've taken an additional photograph um, from the uh, from the paddock towards the cottage of Manor of, of Manor House. The um, I'd, I'd also like to um, point members to uh, the update reports where, where an additional objection was received um, from a third party, and in addition. Um, various um, energy figures um, which have been provided by the applicant um, which indicate the um, the um, oil consumption and the uh, the co2 um, consumption as well and, and the uh, and the, en and the energy um, consumption in kilowatts per hours for the um, current property the demand for the um, from the uh, ground source heat pump and the outputs of the solar panels, which, hope, which hopefully um, answer some of the questions that were raised in the last committee meeting. So the uh, recommendation is, is to approve um, both applications as outlined in, my, in the office report. Thank you very much. Uh, we have several speakers on this item. Um, I'll, can I have Councillor Philippa Paget to the front to start with, please? Thank you. You can start when you're ready. If you can bring the microphone close to you. This room isn't very good in acoustics, so thank you. When you're ready. Thank you. Good morning. Philippa Paget, Vice Chair, Compton Dando Parish Council. Firstly, can I say thank you to councillors who visited on the site meeting recently. Um, Compton Dando Parish consists of five villages, and they are all represented by councillors who live in those villages. L thus, the unanimous decision to object was reached by councillors from a wider area than just Burnett Village itself. Our parish is rural and spans the Chew Valley. The parish council would like to have supported this application because it addresses the climate emergency, but felt the location of the solar panels was totally inappropriate, causing adverse visual impact on the green belt, which is unacceptable. The Parish Council felt that the proposal would significantly change the visual setting of Burnett Village as a whole. The proposed site for the panels is a sensitive area adjacent to the iconic old schoolhouse known as Whitson Lodge and Burnett Church and the Manor House itself, which are listed buildings. Councillors were of the opinion that historic open parkland setting of the Manor House would be lost if this development was allowed. The panels, security fence and high hedging would be highly visible from both homes in the village and the B3116. The park, as it's known, not the paddock, forms the approach to the village. This area of grassland and trees has formed parkland for generations. It is significant in the character and setting of the village of Burnet as a whole, and in particular the wider setting of the manor house. This is not addressed in the heritage statement, which only notes the the view from St Michael's Church and from the Manor House. The particular special circumstances of the need for renewable energy is not outright weighed by the detrimental impact on the Green Belt. Councillors were in agreement that it was important for solar panel location to be considered fully, not to set a precedent for the renewable energy installation were allowed anywhere and more discrete alternatives for siting or choice of materials should be considered. Thus, to borrow the phrase right tree, right place when looking at planting trees for climate emergency, right renewable, right place in this instant. The Parish Council supported the ground source heat pump as this has no detrimental effect. Siting is important. Value for the renewable energy generated must not be at the expense of historic environment or green belt, for example. 
Most of what I've just said is the same as I said at the last planning committee on behalf of the Parish Council. However, I've been asked to bring an additional point to your notice. We are not happy with the Highways Department's response to this application as it does not address the safety of the panels themselves, only vehicle access, parking provision and cumulative traffic impacts. We do not feel the matter of glare from the panels has been addressed. If councillors today are minded to support this application before them, we request that Highways further look into the impact of road safety. Firstly, regarding the glare when vehicles approach from a southerly direction along the B3116 from Marksbury. And secondly, reduction in visibility. Over the years, the open fence style that has been maintained by previous manor owners in order to maximise the visibility, that's the fence that, that, that runs the full length of, of the um, park area um, along the B3116. Most particularly for um, vehicles um, exiting safely from the village junctions. Will the new hedging on the roadside reduce this, bearing in mind that once it is planted, over time it will grow outwards towards the fence um, and the road wider than the planting line? Thank you. Thank you very much. If you could come back and sit behind me, and could I have uh, Rosemary Turner and Richard Arthur now to the front, please? <coughs> So I understand you're sharing your six minutes, so I'll let you sort that out amongst yourselves. Um, who's going to go first? Lovely, okay, well, um, when you're ready, your timer will start. Is your mic on? Lovely, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, naturally one of our objections to this application is the close proximity to our home, Whitson Lodge, which despite not being marked out for you, we hope you were able to see on your site visit. The proposed cell site is 80 foot square, containing eight foot high solar panels emanating from our beach hedge and the road fence. We all know that sustainable energy is the way forward and there is a place for it, but it must not be at the detriment of rural England. Please ask yourselves, would I want this next to my property? The applicant clearly doesn't, as he's already admitted to us. However, the greatest objection of all is the damage the installation of these extremely ugly PV panels will have on an historic village in the Green Belt. The parkland is a frontage to the beautiful Elizabethan facade of the Grade II Manor House and the 12th century St. Michael's Church in my care as church warden for the last 14 years and Whitson Lodge, the Victorian school. These historic buildings are the first sights of the village as you drive along the B3116. What a terrible first impression these solar panels will create. At the last meeting, a speaker suggested that a number of villagers were not adverse to this application. If that is so, why didn't a single one put pen to paper to say so? On the contrary, you can see in the comments that 14 villagers have put their names to objection emails. Two more objections were from ex-residents of Burnett. Two others commented that they would like to see alternatives explored. Even the vicar commented, and I quote, that the church community would like to draw the planner's attention to the sensitivity of the solar panel element. During the consultation period, one family had moved out, one property as an Airbnb, and another two householders were living abroad. So the net objection is over half the village. There are also many more objections on the portal from people who care about this unique village. Furthermore, the parish council were unanimous in their objection, as were the campaign for the protection of rural England and the five villages parish plan of 2010 
calls for the protection and preservation of this green belt in Bath and North East Somerset. We think the strength of feeling against this application is clearly demonstrated. Burnett has changed little since the Doomsday Book, and this has helped to create a microcosm of time-honoured rural England and an atmosphere of continuity, which, in a rapidly changing world, is something very worth preserving. Please do not allow Burnett's heritage to be lost forever. Thank you. Second speaker, when you're ready, please. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit confused because I only got the replies on my last week's email yesterday to say that I could speak, but I'll attempt to get this sorted out. Um, I, I don't need to, I shouldn't need to, but I must reiterate in the strongest terms the importance of preserving the green belt, the heritage, and in this case, the absolute gem that is Burnett. Not for the people who live there at the moment, but for future generations, as you must realize from the heritage of this building. Climate change, climate change goals have to be addressed, but alternative energy can and must be filled, filled sympathetically to avoid um, objections. I understand the need for the council to fulfill the requirements for alternative energy, but I urge them not to do so by overriding pl normal planning conditions applied to the green belt, etc. In this uh, meeting and the previous meeting, I've noticed a number of inconsistencies and disappointing information given to you all. Um, I, I did write, I trust that in future, councillors will question the data provided by applicants and will also be given correct information at meetings, which reflects the true picture. I'm very pleased to see that there was a site meeting and I hope that you've now got a better idea of where the location is and how much of an eyesore it will be. But I noticed again on the slides that you've been provided a picture of a wall, a blank wall, which is supposed to show that the, the, uh, the uh, location will be invisible. It also states on a, uh, a map provided to you that the line along the 3116 and underneath it it says the site will be invisible from a car. This is clearly ludicrous. The wall, for example, is less than, is about shoulder height. So anyone walking along the pavement through the village of Burnett will be able to see this location in full view. So at best, this information is misleading. And it is really unfortunate that the photograph that I provided to Mr. Batrick is not being shown to you today, which shows this. I don't know if you walked around that part of the village, but it is an important part of the village. The park is an essential part of the heritage of Burnett. I've conducted an experiment with, with a mirror and uh, a laser and have concluded that the angle of the solar panels is actually perfect for aligning a setting sun straight into the line along the B1316 into the eyes of oncoming traffic. I also feel that from the way you pull out the very dangerous junction of Burnett, a large screening will actually impinge on that visibility. No amount of screening is going to hide this eight foot high installation with its, uh, with its security fence. And in such a sensitive situation, this will not only send out the wrong message, it will be extremely counterproductive to the cause of solar energy. Many could, who might could not you bring normally your intervene, comments to a close, please? Sorry, many who not normally bid will be uh, motivated to, to raise objections. I urge you to reject this. Thank you very much. If you could come and sit behind me. Uh, next we have um, well, either Hilary or David Oliver. I'm not sure who's going to speak today. Hilary, Hilary Oliver, and could I have Councillor Alistair Singleton as well, please, to the front. Okay, um, Hilary, when you're ready. Good morning. I hope your site visit was helpful in building your understanding of the project, its location, 
and in answering the questions that you had at the last meeting. When we started this project in March 2021, our ambition was very simple. We wanted to help Baines with its response to the climate crisis and to deliver on its policy of local micro-generation and storage to help limit climate change for our children and grandchildren. With a combination of high oil and electricity consumption and unused land, we are well placed to be able to make a significant contribution to your aim of reducing CO2 emissions and reducing the use of fossil fuels. By now, I hope the numbers are well known, but to reiterate, we will use 8,000 litres per annum less oil for heating, saving 20 tonnes of CO2 every year. We will reduce our consumption of electricity from the grid by 11,316 kilowatts per annum. It takes about 2,800 litres of oil to generate that much electricity, which in turn produces 8 tonnes of CO2 per annum. This total of 28 tonnes of CO2 saved is the amount generated by 14 small cars or absorbed by 1,395 mature trees covering 51 football pitches. The use of fossil fuels will be reduced by nearly 11,000 litres of oil per annum. We will still have to draw on over 3,000 kilowatts per annum of electricity from the grid, so we are not building excess capacity. The enablers of these CO2 savings are a ground source heat pump and solar panels. We considered a number of locations for the panels in the paddock. We also considered the roofs of the main house and the lodge. They turned out to be too small, inappropriately orientated, too steep, and crucially, too visible in the village. The location options have been discussed with Mr. and Mrs. Turner. They know that we asked our consultant to return to rerun the numbers of different locations. We also asked if they wanted to discuss different layouts of the panels and they advised that they didn't want to engage at that point and would wait to see the outcome of the planning. I'd like to say that the CPRE who have objected never visited the site. I hope that during your visit you were able to see that the chosen location is the best one as it minimises the impact on trees and heritage assets. It also uses a very small amount of land, has no impact on the rural idyll and is the most efficient location as it is not shaded by large trees. The panels will be discreetly located in a 27 square meter compound, that's about the size of five Mondeo cars, if you can remember a Mondeo, on an unused, low value, compromised piece of land next to a busy road. Interestingly, if you're coming from the north, you will not see the, the uh, compound at all because it'll be hidden by Whitson Lodge. Coming from the south, you'll see it for about eight seconds. But the compound will be surrounded by a 2.4 meter hornbeam hedge designed to merge with an existing hornbeam hedge. Nobody at ground level will see the panels because they will be behind the hedge, nor will they be affected by the glare because they'll be behind a hedge. The spacing between the arrays is the industry standard to prevent one array from overshadowing another. In terms of leaving the junctions in the village, if you leave by the northerly junction, you're blocked by, North, by Whitson Lodge in any event. If you leave from the southerly junction, that is 150 metres away from the, the start of the compound, so you will have no impact on your visibility at that point. The planning officer and all the experts that he has consulted agree that the project has been well thought through and minimises its impact on traffic, ecology, trees, the rural idyll and heritage assets. They also agree that it is in line with all relevant policies and delivers such significant benefits that it should be permitted. Nonetheless, you have a choice. You can either agree with your planning officer and your experts or you can make a subjective decision about whether saving 28 tonnes of CO2 annually and not burning the fossil fuel is a significant enough benefit. That is a decision that requires careful thought. Do you truly believe in the need for projects like this? 
Or are you simply paying lip service to them? Only you can answer that question. But actions speak louder than words. Refusing this application will make it much harder for people to believe in what you say about your responses to climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Singleton, when you're ready. Thank you, Chair. As I said when last we met, the applications before you now are important. They impact the dynamics of a village community and its surroundings, and they also affect our society as a whole. And they represent a case where opinion is sharply divided and emotions have come into play, risking clarity of analysis. It is also a case, I suggest, of a time we will all see much more of in the coming months. There is an inherent tension between a natural desire to conserve and preserve a beautiful and much loved spot and the simple realities of today. Baines, as you know, declared a climate emergency in 2019 and has set a challenging ambition to achieve net zero by 2030. A key element of achieving that resides in a rapid increase in the number, scale, and complexity of renewable energy installations across the district. Current geopolitical events only serve to emphasize the instability of traditional energy markets and the implications for all of us in terms of energy insecurity and pricing. The government's own Climate Change Committee advises that we need to triple the amount of solar PV by 2030 and even the leaks surrounding tomorrow's imminent government energy policy suggest an initial target of doubling it. Baines, as a council, is taking a lead in creating a planning regime and culture which can effectively handle those demands. The applications we are now addressing are for the installation of a ground source heat pump and the associated solar panels and battery infrastructure to run it effectively and optimize its operating efficiency. It is a well-designed and impressive project, and Mr. and Mrs. Oliver have from the outset attempted to go absolutely by the book. They began by taking pre-application advice from the Council's planning team, and have now worked their application diligently through the system, working with the Council's officers to satisfy the various requirements and demands made of them. In turn, each of the Council's conservation, archaeological, highways, ecological, and arboricultural specialists has been satisfied, sometimes with conditions attached. There has been opposition, as you will have seen, much of it from current residents of Burnett. And this is not just a case of nimbyism. There are a number of genuinely held concerns, very often centered on the visual impact of the scheme from the road, or from upstairs at Whitson Lodge. The officer's report tackles the issue of the siting of the panels directly, saying, positioning the installation adjacent to the northern boundary and the hedge that runs along it is considered the least intrusive location within the parkland, factoring in its open viewpoints from the public realm and setting of listing building, listed buildings. As mentioned earlier, officers have listed conditions and it's important that these are complied with to ensure that no unwitting or negligent harm is done to the archaeological or natural environments and that the required tree planting and creation of a proper hornbeam hedge take place. The meticulous and professional approach that Mr. and Mrs. Oliver have taken so far, I suggest, gives no concern that that is likely. If the project goes ahead, the significant carbon saving represents a real win for our communities, both local and further afield. And the report suggests that this outweighs any visual harm that may occur. So, the decision rests, as ever, in a balance of the rights and interests of different parties. On the one hand, we have the applicants seeking to do the right thing, both for themselves and for the broader community on their own land and scrupulously following planning guidance as well as declared local and national government policy. And on the other hand, the rights of neighbors to preserve a part of their beautiful village and maintain unimpeded views. It is the sort of scheme and dilemma that we will see more of in the future 
and will be a pioneer installation for Baines. Officers have examined the application in minute professional detail and weighed it carefully in the legal and planning contexts. The recommendation is to permit, and I believe that that is a fair outcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you'd like, both like to come and sit back behind me. Um, right, could I have questions to the officer, please? Mm -hmm. Councillor Jackson. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm sorry I missed this one before. Uh, there's a reference on page 23 to <coughs> made neighbourhood plans. And I, I somehow sort of assumed that there wasn't a neighbourhood plan covering this area. But I think from what Mrs Turner said, there is. And I wondered if the officer uh, could tell us anything about what the neighbourhood plan might say in respect of uh, energy print, I mean, solar, about, well, solar panels and energy conservation schemes, if, if there's anything there, please. And secondly, uh, it, we've also been told that this application is contrary to policy GB2. Um, the question is, how, am I right, not right in thinking that were we to agree with the officer's recommendation, um, we would, it would not be policy compliant? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, re regarding the um, uh, policy GB2, um, um, strictly speaking, that policy wouldn't apply. The, the, the policy that would apply w is um, the it's the, sec it's the it's the um, sorry, just bear with me. It's, it's a paragraph that I refer to in the, in the national planning policy framework. Um, it's paragraph 151, which, which addresses um, renewable energy developments um, within the green belt. Um, and, 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 that, and, and paragraph 151 um, is, is, is essentially s says that there needs to be um, uh, very special circumstances that um, justify the, 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 de the uh, development. Um, in terms of the neighbourhood plan, I'm so, sorry, just bear with me, I'm just trying to... It might, I mean, it might be that, um, I'm, I'm not sure if another officer could help me on this, but um, I, it, it, may, it may well be that a neighbourhood plan is, in, is currently in, in um, a bit being worked on, but it isn't adopted, which is why it, it wouldn't have been referred to um, in, my, in my statement. Um, okay, if I could ask our um, principal planning officer to help us with this and remind me what GB2 is as well, please. Yeah, yes, of course. Um, so, uh, just uh, looking at the list of communities, that, that Canesham does have a, a proposed neighbourhood plan, um, but it, it, it's not a, a, there's not a, a made neighbourhood plan uh, covering this area currently. So, uh, any of the policies contained within any proposed neighbourhood plans wouldn't have any uh, weight at this stage. So, hopefully that answers your question there. Uh, I think um, there. I th think maybe uh, Councillor Jackson was referring to policy GB1, uh, visual amenities of the green belt. Um, so that is uh, that policy simply says that um, uh, development should uh, try to preserve or protect the, the visual amenities of the green belt. Does that answer your questions, Councillor Jackson? You're looking doubtful. Well, yes, sort of, because one of the speakers referred to a neighbourhood plan, that's, that's all. But um, if it's not been made, it's not been made. I just uh, have an intervention from Councillor Davis. I think I'll be able to help I us with I this one. I think I can answer that. As I was the ward councillor there before, it's not, they haven't got an approved neighbourhood plan, but they did do um, a village, um, like a community plan. So it's not like you've got it Westfield. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, questions? Councillor Hounsell. Uh, thank you. Uh, right, I, I want to um, explore policy SCR3, which is in a placemaking plan. Uh, and this policy uh, uh, sets out in greater detail the factors which proposals for ground-mounted solar energy installation should seek to achieve. And I just want to run through those. It says, including being on non-agricultural or lower-grade agricultural land. Uh, okay, that's clear. 
being sensitive to nationally or locally protected landscapes. Can I just ask you there, um, is that referring to something like AOA, uh, AONB, Area of uh, uh, Outstanding Natural Beauty, or, or would that include Green Belt? Um, so when it refers in the policy to being sensitive to locally protected landscape, is that referring to, to Green Belt, or is that a, 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 a higher bar? Uh, it's my understanding that it's uh, referring to AONB and other protected uh, uh, landscapes. Green, Green Belt has a, has a different sort of purpose um, to AONB, and, it, and it's not. It, it wouldn't be assessed in the same in the same way. Um, so I think that's it's re that's really about um, visually sensitive. Okay, okay uh, thank you. Landscapes. Uh, right now, now the third. Um, uh, criteria mentioned is mis minimi sorry, minimizing visual impact. Uh, can I just clarify that? So it's saying that there mustn't be no visual impact, but it must be minimized. Now, is that site specific? Is it saying that it, it must uh, uh, be the, the minimum uh, impact feasible in that location? I, I agree with that. I think that's a fair w way of, um, of viewing that um, policy, yeah. Okay, Councillor Hansel, Councillor Hodge. Hello, thank you. Um, I'd just like to build on some of um, Councillor Hansel's inquiries. So again, with the policy CR3, I've got two questions around minimising visual impact where possible. So from the site visit, it was clear that the roof of this tall manor house has quite an extensive valley area. Might not be um, the optimum for solar panels, but they would be com could be completely hidden and reduce the area of ground array that's needed in this sensitive site. I just wondered, um, recognizing that it is grade two um, listed, can you explain to what extent you considered a roof mounted option? And also again, in terms of again, minimizing visual impact, um, the panels that are proposed are two and a half meters high off the ground at their highest point. And I um, understand there's alternative um, systems, PEG system, which is only one meter high. Um, were these explored as al alternatives? Um, and also, I wondered whether you, there was ever a consideration of, because the visual impact is so important in this um, um, determination, whether you ever considered a CGI of the visual impact in this location. Right, so um, regarding the, um, the, the option for uh, install it, installing panels within the roof, um, um, uh, that, that, was, that was briefly touched upon in, in, um, in, by one of the speakers. Um, essentially, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the drawback of, of uh, in, in terms of the energy requirements that are needed um, for this development to be um, viable is that the uh, the, the, the solar pa the, 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 the inner uh, value of a roof slope um, is, is too steep and and too enclosed to provide um, uh, sort of sufficient um, uh, en energy um, outputs now uh, in terms of whether a, a hybrid scheme could have been um, uh, is possible that would utilize um, some of the solar panels um, within the within the roof slope to, to reduce the, the scale of the comp um, the panels required within the compound, but that hasn't been um, um, ex explored explicitly. Um, uh, all I can say is really that we've um, I've uh, I've, enc I've encouraged the applicant to um, explain um, the, the the viable uh, well the, the justification for the for the, for the proposed siting. And the sighting is what's in front of us now. So um, uh, I, can, I can only really sort of advise on, 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 on sort of matters relating to the proposed sighting that's in front of us. Yeah, if you've got follow on, carry on. Yes, yeah, so sorry, I've got one f follow on question. Um, another um, requirement of S, um, SCR, SCR3 was that. Um, that one of the factors that is encouraged is engagement at a pre-application with community that that takes place. 
and I, I know you note in the reports that um, there was disappointment that they weren't consulted and um, that comments in the public consultation were taken account. Do, do you feel that meets the requirement? It seems to me that a, a commenting on a fixed proposal is different from being in, engaged in advance. So I'm really asking, was there any um, pre-application involvement with the community at all? I mean, there, there wouldn't have been a pre-application engagement with the uh, undertaken by the council. I, I can't, I can't speak on behalf of the applicant um, in terms of what consultation was made um, informally uh, between um, pu public parties. Um, I, I, the uh, the, the pre-application procedure is. Um, is, is just informal advice um, between the council and uh, the app and, and the applicant of the, of, of the, of the uh, pre app inquiry, so I can't comment on the wider um, consultation process. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any more questions, please? Uh, tell at the same time, guys. <laughs> Hughes. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, a, a couple of questions. I mean, first of all, could you call up the slide that shows the the plots for the solar arrays, please? The schematic. Um, no, the, the the one I think it was before that. It shows the relationship to to the to the field itself. There. Because one thing I was su surprised by when I actually did this, when we actually went on the site visit was the the sheer size of the plot. Um, particularly when I look at it now in relation to the adjacent property, which is quite a sizable property, and you could easily fit that property on that plot for the solar array. Um, so what is the actual um, square meterage of that, that plot? So, sorry to clarify, do you, do you mean the square meterage of, of the compound? Or the, of the compound, yes. The compound, right. So. Um, I, I do have these figures. So it's um, 714 square meters uh, for the compound itself, which works out at um, around 26.7 meters in terms of the length of, of each uh, of, of the um, fencing. So I could just repeat that, please, the size. Right, so the size is it's um, 714 square meters for the area of the compound. Okay, thank you. And another question, with typically when, uh, when, when properties have solar panels, mounted, roof mounted or, or ground mounted, what would we normally expect them to generate as a percentage of their power supply um, from panels? Do we know, would it be a typical house, would they expect 30%, 40%, 50% of their power supply? From, from panels? I, I'm not sure, to be honest. Um, I, I don't have that information. Okay. It, it really, I think it really vary. I, I imagine uh, a lot of the time it's just um, a, f a, few, a few panels just to um, uh, reduce the, the demand on, on, the, um, on the grid um, in, in, in terms of providing their own um, uh, renewable energy. Um, I'm sure okay. there are cases where. The, 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 so, it, it so this be. design then is is probably unusual in as much as it's trying to achieve almost 100% of their power supply from, from but with the use of a, of arrays. Um, I mean, the only thing I'd add to that is that um, well, it, 90, it says 90%, well, but it's 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 looking at an, an option. So in that respect, it's quite unusual. A bit, which so, so I just I just say I mean w w one thing that does make this particularly unusual is because of the, the, the sheer volume of the of the ground source heat pump and the demand that that um, um, that, that requires in terms of um, uh, just under twenty one thousand kilowatts um, per hour um, kil uh, kilowatts hours per annum sorry um, that um, that is in addition to the fifteen thousand that the the, the dwelling itself um, will um, um, de uh, demand, so so it's essentially over doubling the demand. So that's why the, that, that's why the ground source heat pump and the and the solar panels should should really be considered together because of the because of the impact on 
the additional strain, which is which is admittedly is quite unusual, but but, but the, um, the the additional demand that is resulting from the ground source heat pump, which is which is of course to provide the um, replacement of of the eight eight thousand liters of of heating oil. Okay. Um, that 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 demand is so, so it's offsetting both the um, the the demand for the electrical um, demand for the for the property itself and also the demand for the ground source heat pump. Okay. No, it's just in my own mind I'm just trying to get married. this this seems very much a no compromise option where they're to achieve the maximum um, without any compromise at all of a, as close to as possible to 100% renewable energy and I'm just trying to get my head around whether in fact there should be some compromise to allow for the green belt and the the, the residents and neighbors in the village. Um, so the only other question I had was then looking at this this field, the park, as the villagers call it, do we consider that to be a heritage asset as well as the house itself? I think I think the park contributes to the character of the village um, uh, and, and, and its and its rural um, um, sort of the rural landscape of it. It's, uh, I think it's. Uh, I, I don't. I, I don't think that I'd say that it's a heritage asset in itself, but I do think it, it, it definitely contributes okay. to the to the character of, of of the village, which, while it isn't a conservation area, clearly clearly has historic character. Okay, but we accept the fact that the villagers consider it to be a heritage asset. I mean, I, I, I don't want to speak for the villagers, but it's it, it's clear that the the, the park is is valued. Mm. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councillor Jackson, you had another question? Yeah? Uh, this is only a trivial matter, but I'm really trying to work out. We've got the height and the location and the angle of the solar panels, and it's proposed to put a, beach, a beechwood hedge round it, which I sort of think is rather slow growing, probably, compared with a native Somerset hedge for example but when it's grown up to the proposed height is it not going to cast a shadow over the panels I mean to obscure the panels from public view on the road do you not need the hedge higher and will it not then cast a shadow over the panels I, I think that's um, good question I think I think that's been factored into the scale of the um, compounds which as you can see um, the, the, the panels are angled down t towards the south, um, and that's why you've got this gap of, um, which I understand is an industry, industry standard um, gap of 5.4 meters, um, and, and, and that's to accommodate the, um, the spacing around the panels to prevent that sort of um, overshadowing. So that, that has been factored in with the design of the scheme. Okay. Uh, Councillor McPhee, you had a question. Um, could we go back to the uh, picture that you were looking at with Councillor Hughes there? Um, now, from the site visit, would you agree with our conclusion that from the bedroom windows of the Whitson Lodge, you would actually be able to see the rear view of the panels? That's correct, you would, yeah. Which is, one can imagine, a fairly negative visual impact. Um, my second question is, obviously, in coming to the decision as to where to put it, there were perhaps two major factors. Uh, one would be the sunlight, but the other would be the harm. And uh, in, I wonder if, if the uh, relative harms was more important than the sunlight, the fact that the Whitson Lodge had really no protection, you, you, there was no real, because it's not listed, whereas the manor house being listed had a lot more harm associated with it. And that that was a more important decision than actually the variation in sunlight between the two two sites, if you like. I, I would agree with that. I mean, from a planning point of view, we, we, our, our concerns are, are, are really 
the, the, ver the, the various um, constraints of the site and, and identifying harm and, and, and mitigating it. So the, um, the, the optimum, obviously the siting where it is, is, is the optimum location in terms of um, energy gener generation, but that, that, that's the applicant's um, consideration. Our consideration is, is where this would have the least impact. Um, and, and factoring in various, um, uh, various considerations, which does include uh, the, the setting of, of, of both listed buildings um, would have been a, a key consideration, um, as would the minimizing the impact on, on trees. Um, this is the, the, this corner of the plot, of the plot is, as you can see from the, well, from this, this um, I don't know if you, how well you can see that, but um, perhaps if I go on the aerial, you, 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 it will give you a best impression. But it is, um, uh, it would have a le least impact on trees. Um, a, a, and also, as, as, as I mentioned in my reports, um, the, um, uh, the hedge at the boundary of, of Whitson Lodge does provide an opportunity for some degree of continuation rather than um, uh, installing, installing the site, installing the compound in, in a part of the field of, of the park, which would have a, a greater impact on the, op on the openness. I mean, that, that's obviously a, a, decision, a decision for the um, members to decide whether, um, whether, whether um, you agree with my assessment, but that, that's, that's, that's essentially um, how, how, I, how I reach the recommendation. Okay, could you turn your microphone off, please, Councillor McPhee? Councillor Hodge, you had another question? Yes, sorry, just one more question. It's just, um, sorry, just um, for Dominic, the, the argu one of the arguments you make in the, um, about the energy benefits um, versus paragraph 151, um, I just wanted to know what weight, weight you gave um, to this. It is weighing up in principle versus the harms of the green belt. It is implied that the, um, the power generated, the kilowatts per hour per annum, 32,000, will exceed that needed for the heat pump, about 21,000 kilowatts per annum, and that um, there would be enough for d domestic consumption with a surplus that might be fed back into the grid for use by local properties. So this is in your report, whereas the update um, report um, as an adjustment of the figures and actually a little bit um, more will be needed from the grid. So I just wanted to be clear when you talked about the energy benefits of the proposals versus the harm to the green belt, did you include that surplus that you were feeling might be fed back to the community or did you, um, was that a consideration? It's just that it's written up as a consideration. Um, that's a good question. It was, it was a consideration and based on the information in front of me at the time, it did, it, it did imply that there would be a surplus. Um, the information that has subsequently been put forward in front of me um, suggests that there will be uh, a, a minor additional further demand from the, from the grid. So that does conflict with the previous information that was, I was provided. Um, I, would, uh, I, I still think I would, I, would, I, would, I would reach the same conclusion because of the... Um, uh, because of the uh, the overwhelming uh, sort of uh, electricity generation and the and the and the um, heating that would be provided by the ground source heat pump, uh, I, I feel that the um, the, the energy um, uh, provision that that, that, um, that is, would be provided by the development would would um, would outweigh the harm. Now, that's the officer's assessment. It is it is finely balanced, and this is nonetheless. Um, it's, uh, it's within the green belt. Um, it's, it's a balancing judgment um, for the um, for the for the committee as to whether or not um, the the the, um, the energy benefits of the scheme outweigh outweigh the harm that um, has been identified. Okay. Okay. Sorry. One. I've got one quick question. A simpler question. I, I'm sorry if this information was available. And I, I couldn't find it anywhere. But the three meter. Thought it was hornbeam hedge. I, I couldn't find the details of what stage it, um, when it will reach that size, and at what maturity of planting. Is it just hornbeam? Um, it's obviously not evergreen, and or is it a mixture? Um, but, um, I just wanted to be clear exactly on the hedge that's surrounding the compound. 
Uh, so that the hedge would be subject to um, a condition where we can we can make sure that whichever species we we would agree on if, if the application was approved, um, that both the species itself and the height at which it is planted is is acceptable in terms of providing um, uh, sufficient screening from the out uh, uh, you know from the outset and also will we'll provide that long term um, guarantee of of uh, of um, Providing adequate screening, so that's something that I, I, I would liaise with, um, um, uh, in, well, internal uh, um, specialist advice on on that in terms of making sure that the the screening is adequate. Okay, thank you. Okay, are we done with questions? Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to go to Councillor Hounsell to open the debate as the local ward councillor. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, just to say at the outset. Uh, that um, these remarks are introductory remarks and I'm not going to propose a, a motion immediately afterwards because I want to hear from uh, everyone. I don't want to direct the discussion in any way. Uh, we've heard the case made by the applicant, Mrs. Oliver, and the case against made by Councillor Paget, uh, Richard Arthur and Rosemary Turner of Whitson Lodge. Councillor Singleton, Ward Councillor, an advocate for renewable energy, supports this application. Uh, 20 or more local residents oppose. Um, there was talk about establishing you know, the will of the village and uh, reference uh, to strength of feeling, but that is not a planning consideration uh, that can be taken into account today. Uh, it's not a referendum. There have been calls outside this meeting for a further delay and calls for an alternative scheme, but our only role is to consider this application in front of us. It's not our role to determine if this is the best scheme, but only whether it is policy compliant. We are not in any position today to replace one proposal for another. There has been quite a lot said locally about who said what to whom and when, or if people were consulted sufficiently, if at all. These matters are completely irrelevant to our decision today. I too must put to one side any thoughts I might have about fossil fuels and global warming, the heat waves at both poles and the precarious UK energy supplies. The only way we can and should resolve this fairly is by considering the relevant local and national planning policies. The local ones date from 2014. Uh, there was uh, reference to uh, possibly us make, giving lip service to the Council Declaration of Climate Emergency. But if I can just make clear that uh, the Declaration of a Climate Emergency has no weight at all in planning law uh, at the moment, or very, very limited weight. Uh, the hearings for the local plan partial update are to be heard later this year, and the new local plan, which will incorporate perhaps clearer policies around renewable energy in the Green Belt, uh, has not yet been written and doesn't exist. Um, so we, we have these uh, dated local policies and we have the national uh, policy. Now the national policy planning uh, uh, framework is clear in paragraph 151. Uh, it states, when located in the Green Belt, elements of many renewable energy projects will comprise inappropriate development. In such cases, developers will need to demonstrate very special circumstances. Such very special circumstances may include the wider environmental benefits associated with increased production of energy from in renewable sources. This shows that there is no in principle objection to a solar panel array in Green Belt but that very special circumstances need to be demonstrated, and that can be the wider environmental benefit of renewable sources. Existing local policy CP3 does seek to achieve an increase in the level of renewable energy in the district, and targets are given for 2029. Placemaking plan policy SCR3, that's been referred to already a couple of times today, this supports the policy CP3 and sets out in greater detail the factors which proposals for ground-mounted solar energy installation should seek to achieve, including being on non-agricultural or lower-grade agricultural land, uh, and the land we're discussing is non-agricultural, 
uh, being sensitive to nationally or locally protected landscapes, and we've heard this is not a locally protected landscape uh, so as an area of outstanding natural beauty. And, and the third criteria is minimizing visual impact. I note the policy refers to minimizing visual impact, not that there must be no visual impact. With reference to policy SCR3, the, the paddock or park is non-agricultural, it's not in a national locally protected landscape. There's clearly visual impact with this application. The question is, does the proposal minimize the visual impact? I appreciate that the view from some windows and part of the garden of Whitson Lodge will be changed by this development if approved. There's no doubt there will be some harm to the view from Whitson Lodge. However, almost every planning development changes the view for someone. A view in itself is not a material consideration in planning law. Uh, there's no loss of amenity to the residents of Whitson Close by noise or overlooking from a neighbor, uh, for example. And I do note there is an existing hedge between Whitson Lodge and the application site. Manor House is a grade two listed building the solar panels in the proposed position will not harm significantly the setting of the manor house or of the grade two listed St. Michael's Church adjacent to the manor house. This is a requirement on the committee to avoid harm to a listed building. CPRE refers to Burnett as a very special village. There's no obvious center of Burnett. Is it the front of the church? Is it the water pump in Watery Lane? I always feel I've reached Burnett when I draw up in Watery Lane close to those features. In that respect, the location of the solar panel array is on the periphery of the village. And because of that, the location of the solar array might be considered not to affect Burnett's historic charm and character. I believe the applicant has chosen the location so as to maximize the efficiency of the solar panels. And the applicant considers the position the least visible location in the field known as the paddock or the park to almost all the public realm of Burnett. Will there be an effect on highway safety? This could only be a consideration for traffic approaching Burnett from the south. Highways have raised no objection. If we were to disagree with that, it would be impossible to defend any appeal without any evidence to rebut the highway's assessment. Uh, the consideration about glare at the moment is just conjecture and we don't have any evidence in front of us to, uh, to contradict the view of the highways department. What about adverse visual impact in green belt? One can get a view of the site from the window of a passing vehicle traveling from the south or one has to make a fairly brave effort to walk along the road which has no pavement at this location and there is no pavement or viewpoint on the opposite side of the road. What is fundamental to this application, if approved, would be the screening of the solar panel array by uh, trees. Uh, the proposed height of this screening is two and a half meters, just over eight feet. There are many natural features in the vicinity taller than this. Also fundamental is the question of openness of the green belt. Should this application be approved, a condition must be that the screening is planted as quickly as possible. Again, should this application be approved, I would wish the officer to engage with the applicant to secure a plan for removal when this solar panel array comes to the end of its operational working life. Solar panels are not forever and there will be a time when, if approved, they can be removed and the land returned to its original state. So finally, what are the very special circumstances? Uh, to be clear, this is not in any sense a commercial enterprise. The heat pump and the solar panel array together are necessary to provide the kilowatt hours per annum to match the reduction in oil consumption for heating and hot water, plus the current usage of electricity at Manor House. And even then, there is a small shortfall. A relatively modest amount of electricity will still be required from the grid. All th that assumes there are no opportunities to reduce consumption in the manor house, which could be taken by the applicants. The very special circumstances argued are securing the energy needs of this grade two listed building in a sustainable way by using renewable energy and the benefit to the wider population of reducing reliance on uh, fossil fuels. This does not open up all of the green belt to similar development as any application would be tested against our green belt and landscape policies as we are today. 
Priorities for me are maintaining protective green belt and its openness and preserving the character of our villages. The decision on policy grounds hinges on whether the benefits of the proposal constitute very special circumstances and outweigh the loss of openness of the green belt with this solar array at this location, albeit mitigated by screening. At the last meeting, when I was talking about the resource for Earth Planet application, I argued very special circumstances required a compelling case, and so does this. So why, why this proposal and why here? I remain open-minded and wish to listen to others on the committee for their views, and that's why I'm not proposing a motion at this stage. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hounsell. Councillor Bromley. Thank you, Chair. Um, so so there, are, there are two um, principles really here. Um, we're looking at um, the, the openness of the green belt and the interests of the historic village here and the impact of this development, the solar panels on the surrounding area. And um, I question whether the, the impact on the, the Burnett itself and um, the, the openness to the green belt and, and the meadow here, I, I question whether the very special circumstances are satisfied. Uh, for the needs of one house, and I accept it's, it's a manor house, uh, we need to avoid damage to and, and harm to the manor house, but for me um, it's a large development um, and it only satisfies the needs of one dwelling, so for me I, I am very conflicted about this, I have to, I have to say. Thank you, any more contributions to the debate? Councillor McPhee? Um, for me, it's the uh, positioning of... Can you get a bit closer to your mic, please? Sorry. Thank you. For me, <coughs> it's the positioning of that near the Whitson Lodge. It just seems that in looking at those relative harms, <laughs> there was no real balancing off um, the... Uh, the Electricity is generated over there, and the people sit here. And I, I find it very difficult. Everything else I'm happy with, the pump, the size of it. But I, when we were there, I just find that very, very difficult. And I would have preferred to have a little bit more gap. I would have preferred it if uh, the people in the Whitstone Lodge couldn't see from any windows the uh, rear of, of the panels. And that's what's giving me problems to vote on this one. Okay, thank you. Councillor Jackson. Sorry, uh, could you please not begin to speak? Thank you. Councillor Jackson. I thought the site visit was enormously helpful. I must say I got a completely new perspective on the um, application from walking around the park stroke paddock. But I think also this picture demonstrates something very important about this application that it should be read, the whole site should be read as one piece of urban design because that's what would have been intended in the 18th century. It's a sort of scaling down of somewhere like Kettleston Home in Derbyshire where you, you had a sort of a manor and then a formal garden around it and then the wider natural world which was so enormously important. And I feel that this installation is going to disturb that piece of urban design as it was originally attended. Now, it might be justifiable in terms of the need for solar energy, but if you add to it the question of the intrusiveness on the green belt, the loss of amenity to the neighbors, and we might perhaps want to recall our decision about the um, industrial site in Canesham recently, which was very close up to a neighboring property. Um, 
and the impact on a very historic village, I am doubtful about whether we should be approving it, especially in view of what Greenbelt policy is. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Councillor Hughes. Thank you. <coughs> um, firstly, I'd like to say I agree with um, Councillor Housel's um, comment about the fact this isn't a referendum. However, I would certainly say that if half a village and the parish council take the time to object, it certainly gets my attention. Um, I feel that, I mean, none of us live in isolation, so we always have to achieve some type of balance. And in this instance, I just don't see that there is any balance. There seems to be very much a no compromise um, option that's been, been taken. It doesn't seem to me to, to have considered any compromise either for the, for the, for the green belt or for the, the residents and the neighbors. Um, I think that the, 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 the solar array is, is the, both the size and the positioning is inappropriate and disproportionate to the advantages that it will provide. Um, and um, yeah, I just think it, has, it will have a, a negative impact on, uh, on the village. Thank you. Any more contributions to the debate? Councillor Hodge. Yes, thank you. Um, again, I come to, uh, I think there are policy reasons for not um, um, proceeding with this application. And thank you for Councillor Hansel for outlining the policies, but I come to a different conclusion with them. I fully support finding new ways to incorporate solar arrays. We, we really do have to find that. But I note the applicant calls this solar array the compound, and I think it will look like a compound. Um, paragraph 151, the requirement for very, um, that developers of renewable energy developments, that they should demonstrate very special circumstances for the project to proceed. I don't think there are very special circumstances. And the particular location chosen for this array goes against, I feel goes against the openness of the green belt in this specific village and in this significant setting of open parkland. I also think policy SCR3, I think it really goes against the factor and uh, the principles of that. I, uh, there are a number of factors it isn't um, that should be achieved, so it isn't completely um, cut and dry, this policy. But two important factors for me, C, proposing the proposal should seek to minimize visual impact. I don't think this proposal seeks to minimize visual impact. And engagement with the community at pre-application stage, I think are critical factors out of the ones listed. And I think they should have been, all measures should have been taken to comply with that. Finally, policy D6, it, it, you know, it's not, th that policy is, doesn't always help us so much, but it's there to protect residential amenity, avoid harm to private amenity in terms of outlook um, and view. And, but in terms of outlook, who would expect um, black panels, two arrays, 18, almost 19 meters long, four meters wide, um, it's an unexpected change in contrast to the pasture in the green belt. So I think it is a consideration in terms of the impact on outlook and residential immunity. Thank you. Any more contributions to the debate, please? No? Okay. Anybody feeling moved to pass a motion? Councillor Jackson? Well, I was hoping somebody else might with superior brain power, but uh, I, I really feel that we need to um, refuse this application because it is simply too intrusive on the green belt. Um, it will have a very negative effect on a listed building which should be seen as um, it, its curtilage should be taken into proper consideration and it's not got, and, and this for me is the killer, it doesn't really have enough very special circumstances to justify overriding the question of the intrusion into the green belt. We could also add loss of amenity to the neighbor, but I'm not sure that one, that one certainly on its own would not be valid. So your motion is to overturn the officer's decision Refuse. on grounds of uh, impact on the openness of the green belt. Does anybody second that? Councillor Hodge. Yes, I'm happy to second that for the um, reasons that um, Sorry, Eleanor, Councillor. I've forgotten. <laughs> Councillor. 
Jackson, so sorry, blank, but you set out that really the same reasons um, that very special circumstances in the, the green belt is the primary reason haven't, um, haven't um, been fulfilled. I would also like to um, ask whether it, uh, we feel we can say it's not compliant with policy SCR3 for ground mounted solar arrays because of the particular factors that I mentioned previously and D6 impact on residential amenity. Uh, well, that's up to Councillor Jackson if she's happy to accept that. So, the motion on the table is to overturn the officer's recommendation uh, for the impact on openness of the green belt and not being compliant with policy SCR3. Yes. Uh, so, just, just to clarify, Councillor Jackson, uh, the motion has put, uh, I, I've, I've inferred from your comments that you're concerned about the impact on the openness of the green belt, um, a negative impact on uh, the setting of a listed building. Could you clarify whether you are referring to, you're referring to uh, the two listed buildings, um, Manor House and, and the church? Yep, okay, that's, that's helpful. Um, and that you don't believe there are any very special circumstances, or that very special circumstances don't justify the development uh, and there was also a reference to loss of amenity um, of the neighbour from Whitson Lodge. Um, could you just clarify that impact in terms of the amenity? What, what, what impact is being alleged? What harm to amenity? Well, currently, they enjoy the amenity of looking out over the paddock. Now, I do appreciate that you don't have a right to a view, but the character of their dwelling is going to change because it's going to feel, be, be more enclosed and, and, and sort of built up if this is there. And particularly, I'm, I'm, a, I'm um, worried about the hedge, to be quite honest. But that, one, that one's not so important. But I do feel there is a loss of amenity that should be recognised. Uh, uh, and also, could I just clarify on, there was reference to policy SCR3, and I think Councillor Hodge commented about the impact um, on uh, minimising visual um, harm as, as, it, the as the proposal not meeting that part of the policy and a lack of community engagement. Can we just clarify that? Is your mic on? Sorry, yes. So factor C is proposals seek to minimise visual impact and fact factor D is engagement at pre-application stage with the community takes place. That, I mean, that didn't take place. Okay, uh, I'll just summarise then, as, I, as a, the motion, as I understand it, um, is, that the, uh, is to uh, overturn the officer recommendation to refuse the application on the basis of impact on openness to the green belt, a, a negative impact on the setting of the uh, listed buildings uh, on the site, uh, loss of amenity for the neighbour, primarily relating to the, their outlook from that uh, first floor window, and conflict with policies SCR3, uh, those specific points just referred to, and, and D6. Uh, and, that, and that together, there's no very special circumstances um, that would outweigh those harms. Happy with that? Okay, so the motion we have on the table is to overturn the officer's recommendation for the reasons stated, proposed by Councillor Jackson, second to Councillor Hodge, and just to be clear, this is the full application. We have the listed buildings one to do after this, so this first votes with a full one. So all those in favour? Sorry, uh, if you, Sally's got, and you're in favour as well, Councillor Simmons. Yeah. Eight in favour. And those against? Two against. Uh, and I think that's full, the full number, isn't it? The no abstentions. So that motion is carried. Thank you. Um, while we uh, switch officers, would the... Um, so you need to do the other one. We need to do the list of Oh, children. sorry, we got to see the LBA one. Thank you, pardon. <laughs> Thank you, Sally. Um, would the same people like to propose and second the LBA as well? Yeah, so, sorry, yeah, can we have a vote? All those in favour, please. And against? Eight in favour, two against. So that's carried as well. Sorry. Thank you. So that's that one done. We'll have a comfort break while we're switching offices.
Okay, great. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, so the next one up is Church Farm Priston. If I could ask the officer to do her presentation when she's ready. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, this application relates uh, to the erection of two dwellings and associated works following the demolition of equestrian-related barns uh, at Church Farm in Priston. So here we have the site location plan over here with the proposal site shown in red. And then for context, there's an elevations of, of the plots. You can just see, I hope you can see, there's a sort of orange dotted line um, which uh, shows heights, etc. cetera. Um, and you can see the dwellings in context with the surrounding trees. And then some site photos. So this site, this photo here is, is going into the site up the track. Those who went on site visits will remember that we drove down the track towards the barns. Again, on the approach, the parking area where uh, people sort of park their cars on the site visit is just here. And then we approach into the site and you've got the larger of the two barns. You can just see here the uh, smaller curved roof barn just through the trees. And then some pictures of the, of the barns themselves. Uh, with the hay and equestrian related uh, paraphernalia inside. And then this photo was taken um, sort of further up the field, looking back towards the site. Um, so you can see some of the existing dwellings and buildings over here. You can just see the church as well um, in the village, so it's just a bit of context. So the proposal is recommended for permission uh, for the reasons outlined in the officer report. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, we have four speakers on this one. If I could have um, Robert Davies from Preston Parish Council and Peter Brooks, please, up to the front to start with. Uh, Robert Davies, when you're ready, please go ahead. Thank you very much. I hope you'll visit site visits to Priston enabled you to get a better feel for the situation. The key issue where the parish council believes the case offer is, case offer is, is mistaken relates to previously developed land. This is significant because land and buildings classified as agricultural carry no previously developed rights, whereas those with equestrian classification can claim previously developed rights, including residential development in the green belt. And this is specified in the NPPF. The case officer has determined that the whole area of the barns proposed for demolition and redevelopment is covered by a certificate of lawful use, establishing equestrian as opposed to the previous agricultural use. And it's therefore previously developed land Priston Parish Council contends that the case officer's determination is mistaken on the two following grounds. Firstly, the officer maintains that a plan filed with the application for the Certificate of Lawful Use, date stamped 25th of November 2004, which outlines the two bars proposed for development, is the relevant one, even though it's been superseded and it does not even include the site for the proposed manege or horse exercise yard, which was the whole purpose of seeking the certificate. It would be helpful here if you could refer to uh, an email which I sent at the weekend, and or, or uh, th this is also on the website, uh, a plan um, which, which um, what I've just referred to is referred to is, is first plan, plan one. That's the case officer's uh, contention. The parish council contends there's a later plan, date stamped 6th of July 2005, plan two, supersedes this by eight months. Plan two shows that only the western edge of the barns is delineated as equestrian use and explicitly excludes the major part of the proposed development site. Plan three, dated the 17th of October 2005, atta is attached to the successful planning application for the manege and is identical in all res important respects and is somewhat clearer than the previous one. And it, it, it is tied to plan two. Uh, and it must be considered as authoritative. Plan three, attached to the planning application, shows that the main part of the proposed development site lies outside the area delineated as equestrian use. 
There was good reason for, for limiting the area for equestrian use. It was restricted to seven horses to prevent any possible nuisance from the expansion of the livery following the installation of the manege. Secondly, the case officer contends incorrectly that any ambiguity in the certificate of lawful use was dispelled by a site visit which established to her satisfaction that horse-related items were on site and that the entire site was in equestrian use. The parish council maintains that the keeping of horses Could you bring land, your comments to a close, please? Uh, 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 just a few more lines. The, the, the keeping of horses on land or horse-related items does not confer equestrian use on that land. Land retains its agricultural classification unless that is changed by a certificate of lawful use or a planning consent. And any rights enjoyed by land classified as in equestrian use do not extend beyond the specified curtilage of that land. Uh, I think I need to bring okay. close now. Thank you. Um, Mr. Brooks, when you're ready, please. Because your officer has recommended approval without, in my opinion, and my neighbour's views, sufficient conditions and details, I'm appealing to the committee, should you be minded to approve the application, to take heed of the many representations made by long-term local residents, to please, please apply more rigorous conditions that will safeguard existing properties, protect against yet more greenbelt development creep, and avoid the need for neighbours to take complaint action against the council should problems result from not doing this. After all, we've no idea who will develop this site, and you and we do not want to be reliant on the goodwill of a profit-driven developer. I'm a construction professional and a self-builder. I, I built the orchard a few years ago. My wife and I have lived right next to this site for over 30 years, first in a house known as the milking parlour, and now the orchard. Both houses are on ground slightly lower than that of the site, and lower than several miles of farmland that slopes up to the west. From time to time during prolonged periods of rain, this farmland becomes waterlogged and large volumes of potentially destructive water, surface water, run down through the site of the barns. We ask for a condition that requires vital existing drainage arrangements on the site that channel away runoff water from neighboring farmland be maintained or improved. After all, some of these were put in place by the applicants themselves and they fully understand why they're essential. Not to do this appears negligent to us. Please ask the case officer why this is not part of her recommendations. We ask for a condition that precludes the use of the narrow access track for getting to any remaining or new equestrian facilities that might be established. We ask for a condition that prevents further change of use around the site that might later enable yet more housing development further into the green belt. We ask that clear dimensions are applied to the drawings before permission is granted that show ridge and eaves height properly from a benchmark and distances from existing structures to the walls of the new houses. Leaving such dimensions out seems fundamentally, fundamentally wrong and we so see no wholesome reason for, for this. We ask for a condition that before development commences, foul drainage arrangements are fully approved. And lastly, I ask that the access road be properly surfaced along its full length before occupation. I hope you appreciate these are not the vague whinges of NIMBYs, but instead clear appeals for measures to be taken that will help ensure any development you approve will be as successful as possible with as few disputes as possible and as few queries, complaints or claims as possible addressed to you and your planning department by me or others nearby. The header of your update report says, Bath and North East Somerset Council, improving people's lives. So please do this by granting what I've asked for. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if you come sit behind me, could I have Dan Washington now, please. Thank you. Uh, my name's Dan Washington. I am a director at BBA Architects and Planners, and we've been involved in the planning and design of this planning application. My colleague, Matthew, and spoke at the last planning committee meeting. 
as you will be aware, the planning officer's report, this, this current scheme is effectively a redesign of a previous scheme submitted by BBA for three dwellings. That scheme was withdrawn following concerns by council officers of the scale of the dwellings and their contemporary appearance. This scheme has addressed those issues by reducing the scale of development so that now two more modest, predominantly single-storey family dwellings are proposed, which utilise local materials. The dwellings proposed footprint, volume and height are much smaller than the original design scheme and far smaller in size than the existing barn. Barns, I should say. The, dwell the dwellings have been designed to, to complement existing surrounding buildings and have less of a visual impact on the surrounding area than the existing large barns. Much correspondence has been had with planning case officers on this planning application to address any con questions or concerns raised by consultees or neighbours. In terms of the principle of development, a lawful development certificate back in 2005 confirmed the site's lawful use for equestrian purposes and therefore confirmed that it's previously developed land and appropriate for redevelopment. Additional information has been provided to the council in the form of photographs and bank statements uh, to confirm its ongoing use since 2005. And members have now had the opportunity to see the site is still being used for the stabling of horses with associated ancillary storage. Neighbours have asked questions about drainage impact of the proposed development. Information has been submitted to the council in the form of flood risk assessment and a drainage strategy. And the council's drainage officers have no objection to the proposed scheme. In addition, we've also sought to directly answer questions on drainage from neighbours, and if the committee consider that any further information on drainage is required, this could be secured through an appropriately worded condition on any planning commission. It is noted that the condition on drainage has been recommended by the council's drainage officer, which should address neighbours' concerns. In summary, the scheme has been carefully considered to take into account comments on the previous scheme and address issues raised. The scheme now before you has addressed any issues raised by council officers and we ask you support case officers' recommendation and permit the scheme. Thank you very much. Um, my councillor McCabe was supposed to be speaking, but I'm afraid he's fallen victim to COVID, so he can't be here today. Um, but our democratic services officer is going to read his statement. Thank you. The situation with this application has a degree of complexity a large farm has been broken up over the years with buildings converted to residential housing. The last two barns remain and the owners are looking to develop the site. You have now been to the site and have seen the new development on two sides, the manège to the north and the open fields to the west. Clearly, the large barn would lend itself to a class Q change of use with two or three units inserted into the existing structure, as has happened elsewhere. Instead, the owners are looking to demolish and build housing more in keeping with the local building design and claim that the equestrian status of the buildings allows them to do that. They have worked with officers to reduce the number of new units to two and those plans are before you now. I note that the applicant has sought to reduce the built form on site, which would obviously not happen under a class Q application. There is a snag though, the buildings are outside the housing development boundary and additionally, the parish council has pointed out that the most recent equestrian CLEU did not cover all of each barn. On the map, you have seen the blue line only includes about one third of the large barn and one quarter of the Dutch barn. So technically, we have to ask if that is sufficient to allow for the demolition of both buildings to develop a site outside the housing boundary. This remains the key consideration. Mr. Davis from the Parish Council and CPRE has argued these points very thoroughly, that these buildings do not qualify for demolition. Certainly, everyone agrees that policy GB2 is not met. Officers have considered all the points raised in consultation, and it is the case officer's view that the requirements of the relevant policies have been met and therefore the principle of development on site is accepted. The officer then takes an on balance view that given compliance with all other policies, a departure from GB2 is acceptable. On the site visit, you may have met with neighboring residents who seem to take a pragmatic view. Should you be minded to accept the officer's recommendation to permit, then they believe it is not unreasonable for them to ask the road surface to be improved and the surface water runoff to be addressed. I would support this request. 
You will recall that the tarmac runs out and there is a short section of dirt track before the concrete turning circle. It is felt that it would be easy for the applicants to rectify this as part of the development, as any new residents would be using it as well. You may also recall the trench dug for surface water runoff from the field. The track then carries this water along two sides of the site to a drain with a bund protecting neighboring properties. Again, neighbors do not believe it is unreasonable to ask that this is dealt with somehow. I know the relevant officers have considered these two requests and have not required further action, but I would ask members that if you are minded to pit, permit, as per the officer's recommendation, that you please condition the track and the surface water runoff to be addressed as part of the development with a request that the applicants indicated would be happy to comply with. Thank you, Councillor Matt McCabe. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, questions to the officer. Mm, Councillor Hughes. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so my question is really around the housing development boundary. Um, so we go through quite a comprehensive process in this council when we establish the housing development boundary. It goes through various reviews with officers and councillors, LDF committees, etc. Um, and effectively, that's a democratic process to determine what's best for the location and what impact it's like to have. We, I guess the process considers all aspects of where that boundary should be. So I'm trying to understand why this one should be given any special circumstances because surely the process should be that in the first instance, there should be a request for a boundary review through the partial, the full updates, local, local plan updates. And once that boundary review is completed and, full, and decides to move the boundary, then would be appropriate time to apply for planning permission. Yeah, I'll just go back. Sorry. Yeah, so you're correct. So this is obviously the map showing the housing development boundary and the site is just outside this. And you're right, policy GB2 um, directs development in the green belt in, inside the housing development boundary. Um, there has been case law, and this was referenced in the um, officer report, the case of High Court decision of Wood versus Secretary of State 2015, um, which says that in, in some cases there needs to be an assessment of um, how the village appears on the ground. Um, and the case officer in, in this case has, has had a look at where the housing development boundary is. And I, I don't know, you know, members may agree, sort of on, on the ground, the site is, it's red as part of the, the, the cluster of, of those dwellings and it is red as, as part of the village. So there's no disagreement here that it is contrary to policy GB2. Whether or not this, the, the housing development boundary in this location is to be revised as, the, as part of the LLP, LLPU, I don't know. Um, but so it would be a departure from the development plan, but it is considered that because sort of viewing the village on the ground, it, it is justified in this case. I mean, that is, it is a matter of planning judgment, so it's for the committee to decide, but that, that's the opinion of officers, that it would be justified in this case. Okay. Uh, sorry, just... Oh, you've got so, a follow-on, yeah. Yes. So, so how do we then, as a council, how then do we control creepage when, you know, how do we then stop the the adjacent areas then, then becoming part of a, another development if we don't have any boundaries that we adhere to? As I say, it's, it's case by case. If, if an additional development came forward in any of the surrounding fields, you would have to make that assessment again. I think, you know, you look at, you have to look at proximity to other buildings, but that's not the sole assessment. I think it's, it's the way the buildings would relate to, to the, kind of the main core, I suppose, of the housing development boundary. So yes, that is a possibility, that is a concern, but every, every case is assessed on its own merits and that's kind of the matter that the committee have to, have to come to a conclusion on. Okay, Councillor Jackson. Yeah, I mean, following on from that, you see, I think, should we not be concerned that if we permitted this one, um, there would be no reason why you couldn't put in an application for two houses on the actual menage site, which, which I have to say, didn't look as though it had been used for some time. So that's the first question. Can we stop planning creep if we say there are very special circumstances 
to allow development outside the housing boundary. And I, I'm not sure we have got any very special circumstances anyway. But I'm, not, I'm afraid I failed to look up what the housing needs of Priston are deemed to be. These are not affordable housing. Um, and secondly, those were perfectly good barns. I mean, whoever wants to use them for whatever, they were modern, upstanding, watertight, and everything else. And in previous cases where we've considered this sort of application, the barn has been half derelict. Is it a, a matter of material consideration that these are proper functioning barns and could be used, you know, maybe breeding dogs or something? I mean, you know, they could have other uses and they could have employment uses. Well, because we've talked about this change from um, agricultural to residential, but I'm concerned about loss of a potential employment site in a rural area. Yeah, I will answer your last question first um, in terms of the agricultural, the, the equestrian barns, sorry. Um, I mean, it's, 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 it's not for us to tell the applicant what they can and can't apply for permission for. Um, I think we have to remember that the application before us is to demolish those barns, regardless of, of the state which they are in. Um, if, if, the, if the permission was refused, there's nothing, to, uh, you know, there, there's, there's nothing stopping the applicant ceasing using them at all. Um, you know, we, we, can't, we can't dictate what, what the site is used for if, if permission is not granted for this application. Um, I wouldn't, this, this isn't considered in planning policy to be um, an employment site. Um, so I, I wouldn't feel comfortable refusing it personally on, on the basis of, of the loss of the barns in that respect. But again, that's for the committee to decide. Um, in regards to additional development in the Menage, the Menage, which is located to the north up here, which members who came on the site visit will have seen, um, there, that was granted permission, um, as far as I'm aware, in October 2005. Uh, and there was a condition on that permission, which I'll, I found and I'll read it out. Um, if the menage is no longer required or it is not used for more than three months, the land shall be returned to its former condition, including resurfacing with topsoil and grass to the satisfaction of the local planning authority. Um, so if, if, if the menage is no longer in use, then it would need to be turned back into, into a field, essentially. Um, whether or not other applications could possibly come forward on that site, Again, you know, same as sort of I responded to Councillor Hughes, they may come forward, they would need to be assessed, you know, within, within, the, uh, within their own merits. Um, again, in terms of whether that would be a departure from GB2, if we were minded to permit, it, it may be, but, you know, without actually seeing a scheme, we can't predict what may or may not come forward on those sites. Okay, Councillor Jackson, to answer your questions. Councillor Davis. Yeah. Um, the, there is clearly a condition to do with the drainage. Do you think it is strong enough for what's been sort of suggested by both the um, applicant, actually, and what the Council McCabe said, and uh, the residents as well? Yeah, so I've had a look through the uh, comments from our flooding and drainage team. Um, I've had them here. In the first instance, the drainage information wasn't considered to be satisfactory. Um, and in response to that, a revised sort of drainage plan was submitted. Um, our, our drainage and flooding team have said that that plan is, is acceptable. Um, they've recommended a condition, a uh, pre-commencement condition, um, which is, requires the applicant to demonstrate that the onward drainage system can take the flow uh, which is proposed. If it can't, um, then an alternative it needs, needs to be proposed and agreed. Um, so that is the view of our drainage and flooding team that that is sufficient. Um, I mean, there is the potential, you know, if the committee did want to either change or, or add a condition, um, a pre-commencement condition for a full surface water drainage strategy, that, that would definitely be within, within your prerogative um, as long as we can kind of justify, justify the reason for attaching that. So yes, in the view of, of officers, what's being proposed is sufficient, but you know, there is the potential to change that if, if necessary. Okay, any more questions for the officer? Oh, Councillor Bromley, yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, if we were minded to permit, um, Priston is a dark village. Uh, do, do we have any further detail on the type of lighting that would be used, um, especially around the exterior of the property, properties? 
Yes, there is uh, condition 14 is um, an external lighting condition. So it requests that uh, full details of the proposed light, any external lighting um, is submitted to the council prior to installation and approved in writing. So our ecologists would have sight of any external lighting which may come forward. Okay, uh, sorry, Councillor Hodge. Yeah, so I've got a, a question. So it's not very specific and it's going over the same points, but I can't resolve them in my mind. So two thirds of the site to be developed is outside the certificate of lawfulness from, from the blue line on the 2005 diagram. And my understanding is that in the future, that the someone could come forward and ask to develop another area within that blue that large blue space. So, looking at uh, in the officer's report, it, the the, um, the agreement that GB2 isn't complied to, that the officer's report doesn't use the words very special circumstances, and it, the the only case seems to be that a general case about needing more housing. Have have uh, in Canesham and um, the core strategy wanting more housing. So I'm I'm confused really about what the, the, the definite case is for permitting a development that isn't compliant with GB2 and mostly doesn't sit within the certificate of lawfulness. So I'd really like to be clear on those, um, the special circumstances that um, allow that to happen. And to be clear again, that I think you have already said that other developments everywhere in that blue, big blue area, does count as previous de previously developed land, so there could be more applications coming forward to expand the village in that those areas. Yeah, so I think I'll answer this in in two parts. I mean, the first the first is um, really whether the site is considered to be previously developed land. So the certificate of lawfulness um, two thousand four two thousand and five um, did only include a portion of of the barns. Now. A certificate of lawfulness isn't a planning application. It's, it's merely a, a certification as to whether or not a current use is, in this case, is considered to be lawful. Obviously, that was granted in 2005. Now, there are other, there are other ways that uses can become lawful, um, obviously through planning permissions, but also through passage of time. Um, so there have been 17 years since that, that CLEU was granted. Um, I, you know, I... I agree with the case officer who wrote the report, her assessment, um, and you know the site has has continually been used in the in the in the use of equestrian um, for for a period of time, which is it seems you know is, is considered to be greater than the ten years. So it is the view of officers that the land is previously developed land. Um, so the reason that it can be developed in the green belt is because it falls it falls under uh, exception G of paragraph 149 in the MPPF, which allows for uh, the redevelopment of previously developed land um, on the proviso that the development proposed is is doesn't have a, a greater impact on the openness of the green belt. Now, the, the case officer has run through this in her report, but considers that the dwellings proposed don't have a greater impact on the green belt. Um, as for the rest of the site, I mean, m members will remember, you know, that it, it, it appeared relatively undeveloped, whether it's used for equestrian or not. There weren't really buildings, etc., on the site. And I think, you know, there is a case that development coming forward, possibly for housing, may have a, a, a greater impact on the Greenbelt. And again, that's something that would have to be looked at if those applications came forward, and they would be assessed on their own merits. So I can understand the concern about, about departing from GB2 in this case, but assessing what we have before us we can't we can't predict what may or may not come forward in the future and those would have to be assessed on their own merits at the time okay do i have any more questions councillor jackson i was wondering what weight we should give to the question which the parish council have raised about the sustainability of this site i've lived in this area for 18 years i have never been through the village until we did the site visit and that's because the nearest bus route sort of just skirts the top edge um, and it's a route that's under threat so should we should we be concerned that whoever lives in these um, residences would need to have a car yeah I think this is this is um, kind of reviewed in the highway section of the report but yes it is 
it is noted that the site does have limited opportunities for sustainable travel, um, given its given its location within a village which isn't you know largely served by sustainable sustainable public transport, etc. Um, however, given the proximity to uh, uh, existing dwellings. Um, we think it'd be quite difficult to resist the application on that basis. I don't know if Tom has anything to add, but um, given, given its location within the village adjacent to dwellings which already exist and already have that situation, it's not considered that an objection on the grounds of sustainability is, is justifiable in this, in this matter. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I was, I was just going to add that we also considered that there was an existing use on the site which would generate trips. Um, so that was another consideration that we took um, when uh, looking at the sustainability of the site. So whether there was significantly additional harm to what might be there already. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? No, no more questions from anyone? No, okay, we'll move to the debate then. Would somebody like to open the debate? Councillor Davis. I think um, the, the re removing the barns and putting two lower dwellings will not have an, an adverse impact on the green belt. Um, and it is very adjacent to the housing development boundary. To me, it does seem to be the right decision here. I'm not 100% certain whether we do need to add anything to do with the uh, drainage. It has been approved, so the officers have looked at it and feel it's suitable, so I'm, um, maybe the conditions are right. But my mind at the moment is thinking that to go with the officer's recommendation, um, which I would move or wait for further debate, whichever. But I think, I think as we are at the moment, I just would be interested whether anyone thinks anything else on drainage might be uh, appropriate. Okay, thank you. Any more for the debate? Councillor Hounsell? Uh, if that's a proposal from uh, Councillor Davis, I would second it. Uh, I don't think it is at the moment, but thank you. It, it can. I ju I'm just not sure about the drainage, whether that's uh, su sufficient. I, yeah, I'm not sure it's sufficient yet. Okay, uh, so no motion moved yet. Do we have any more contributions to the debate? No. Uh, Councillor Hughes. Sorry, I, I'm still not comfortable that with this, with, um, I, I don't see any special circumstances to ignore our housing development boundary policy. So I'm still, I, I can't see the justification for, for moving outside of our boundary. Thank you for that. Councillor Jackson. Well, well, I have to say, I feel that if we have these two houses here, it will alter the character of the area. But I'm more, I note they've reduced it from three to two. I'm more concerned it's overdevelopment of the site. I, I could, you know, a, a small low-lying bungalow would be fine, but this is going to be effectively one and a half storeys, uh, as I understand it, um, of two potentially family residences. Okay. Anybody else wish to contribute? Councillor Davis? If no one else does and no one else seems to be worried about the drainage, I'm pr happy to move the officer's recommendation as printed in front of us. Thank you very much. And Councillor Hounsell? No, I will second that. You'll second that. Okay. So nobody else wants to contribute to yeah, Sorry. I, I, the other point that, in terms of conditions, there is a condition about surface water drainage, and I suppose we need to be clear whether that's enough. And secondly, that the... Um, there's a very clear request for that the um, there's a condition for um, development of uh, the track into a, a proper a proper surface and proper road that was requested. Is is that possible to have that as a condition? So could I have a view from the officer on whether it's possible to condition tarmacking of the road? And I think we need to go back to Councillor Davis to see whether she would agree yeah. to change her motion to include those. Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, I think this would be possible. The, the track is included within the red line. Um, I, I would say that we would have to be able to fully justify attaching that condition. 
um, and it would need to pass the six tests of the MPPF as to whether it was necessary and reasonable to request it. Um, I mean, officers, including highway officers, have taken the view that the track as existing would be able to accommodate the um, additional traffic. But you know, if we could if we could fully justify that condition, then it could be added to to the recommendation. Okay, Councillor Davis. I'm quite happy to, if I've changed it, delegate from it, then we can ask the officer to um, speak, um, uh, to try and take those further if necessary, if I use delegate to permit. So I'm quite happy to change it as delegate to permit. Okay, so, so the motion is to delegate to permit, to take a look at... Quite yeah, happy with that. Councillor yeah. Hansel agrees. Um, so to look at the two possible conditions, which is one on the drainage and one on the road surface. Um, principal planning officer, is that clear? Uh, yeah, I, I believe that that's pretty clear. Uh, move with the officer's recommendation, delegate to permit, uh, with review of two, a new condition, possibly uh, tarmacking of the track, and uh, possibly amending or adding a condition regarding drainage, uh, drainage strategy. Okay, everybody clear on that? Anybody else want to contribute at all to the debate? Let me move to the vote. So, um, motion is to um, change the officer's recommendation to delegate to permit, um, with the condition stated, propose a councillor Davis, second a councillor Hansel, all those in favour? Seven in favour. And against? Three against. So that is carried. Thank you. Right, we have the same officer now for the next one, so we can move straight on to that. I appreciate we're running late. I will make sure the committee gets 40 minute lunch break, so we may be starting our afternoon session a bit late. Councillor Simmons, can I just be absolutely clear? This is the one that, that you declared at the beginning. So will you be speaking as a public speaker, as it were, and then stepping off the committee? Have I understood that? Okay. Thank you. So, um, Isabel, if you're ready. Thank you, Chair. Yep, this is the uh, proposal which also went to site visit for the erection of a front side and rear extension um, at 16 Broadlands Avenue. An attic uh, loft conversion with a dormer is also proposed as well as a, a garden room. So this is the site location plan. The dwelling is here in red. This is St. Francis Road. There's another row of dwellings behind the uh, property and then St. Ladock Road is kind of off over here off, off the map. Um, an aerial view, you can just see the property here and then the lane to the rear which we stood on at the site visit. So the existing floor plans, um, I've got the ground floor of the dwelling here, the first floor and then the second floor which is uh, as of yet kind of un undeveloped. Um, we've also got uh, to the rear of the property there is a garage uh, and shed just here with the with a fence line separating it in between, which members will remember from the site visit. So there's a number of elements to the proposal. There is a two-storey side extension, which has a, a width of around one and a half of metres, a single-storey front extension across the front of the property, a single-storey rear extension, which you can actually see better here on the first floor plan, and then a loft conversion, which will provide a bedroom in the roof space uh, with a dormer to facilitate that. And then we've got the existing garage and shed will be demolished, removed from the site, and a garden room uh, is proposed to the rear. So this is actually better shown on the block plan, so you can see all the different elements. You've got the garden room here, the single-storey rear extension, the two-storey side extension, and then the dormer here on the roof. So the existing elevations of the property, the property has a, a hipped roof as existing with a small single storey rear extension which goes across sort of half, half of the house. Uh, the proposal will include this front extension here which goes sort of across the bay window. Uh, the conversion of the loft will involve the gabling of the roof with the dormer to the rear and the side extension which brings the uh, width of the house out by about one and a half metres. Um, you've got a single storey uh, extension to the rear as well. 
And then on this side, you've got the uh, garden room. So this is the existing uh, kind of single single width garage, which members will remember from the site visit. Uh, the garden room is is proposed to kind of fill the width of the plot um, and be located sort of on the footprint of the shed and the uh, garage. Some site photos. So this is the existing property from the front. Um, you can see that, you know, there, and this was noted on the site visit as well, there are other properties which have uh, gabled their roofs. And then from the rear, so this is the existing single story rear extension. There are other dormers as well, you can see in these photos down here on neighbouring properties. And then these are some photos from the uh, rear lane. So this is the entrance of the rear lane, uh, the vehicular access, which is off of St Francis Road. Um, and then you get you get to the rear of the of the lane. These are some photos here. This is the edge of the existing garage, which will be uh, removed. Again, you can see it here. This is looking the other way, sort of down down the lane. And then a couple of photos of the site. So this garage and the shed will be removed, and the garden room will fill to the rear of this plot. So the application is recommended for permission for the reasons in the committee report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. We have two speakers. If I can have Sarah Newman to the front and Councillor Simmons to the front as well, please. I'm speaking on behalf of uh, the resident in next house. Um, she's unable to attend to... Uh, sorry, is that Sarah Newman then? So can I... Um, she's... Yeah. Her complaint is overlooking... overlooking Brian, can you can you go to Sorry. the front? Brian, Overlooking Councillor loss Councillor of Simmons, privacy. Can you go to the front to speak, please? Sorry. Do you want to go to the front to speak? Oh, I've got to go. To, sorry. Yes. So Councillor Simmons is standing in for uh, a speaker who can't be here, Sarah Newman. I've got that right, haven't I? Okay. When you're ready. Um, right. Over her complaint is overlooking a loss of privacy. The extent of the development, particularly at the rear, will look directly into my property. Either there is a requirement for a window in the back garden development to be glazed, there is no guarantee that the window will not be opened or that the glass will not be replaced at some point. There is a loss of light or overshadowing in terms of light as acknowledged in the last planning meeting I dialed into about this application. There will definitely be a negative impact on my property, particularly with regard to the garden extension. And the next item is parking. As you will see from your site visit, parking it is extremely challenging in the road already. The road is very narrow. And unless people break the law and park on the pavement on occasion, the road very easily becomes blocked. I know the residents are very concerned about the impact of even more vehicles in the road, particularly as this will inevitably block driveways, giving the placing of those on the road. Highway safety is the next item. Again, as I hope you hope was seen when you conducted your site visit. The road is very close to a school, accordingly particularly difficult. At the beginning of the end of school day, the school road can be even more congested with traffic and at times the amount of vehicles on the road would make it impossible for emergency vehicles to drive down even as things stand. Things stand. Also, many of the children in this cul-de-sac play in the street and I've got serious concerns about the increased danger to them if there are even more vehicles driving up and down the road. Um, and the next one, I don't know how far I've gone. I understand it's the intention of the garden to property to be accessed by the privately owned back lane, which borders on the back of St. Laidot Road. On the assumption that you walk down that lane, you will have seen its poor condition, and it's even more worse in after sustained rain. Many of the residents' objections relate to the concerns about this lane, which up to now seem to be largely overlooked. Traffic. Following on from the above, I am very concerned about the impact of traffic if the proposed development goes ahead. The levels of traffic for the width and length of the road are considerable already. And there is nature conservation. At the end of my garden is a line, large pine tree in the back lane. I'm very concerned the extent of developments at the back of will damage that tree, particularly making it unstable. As a general point, I would like to ask for numerous objections from residents and the rejection of the plans by St. Canesham Town Council be given due consideration, as well as all the points above. It's also worth point making that the current owners of number 16 do not live in the property and very rarely visit it so have little understanding of, them, of the massive problems the work would cause. They've made no attempt to engage with the residents about their plans. With all due respect, if they had made some attempt to liaise with the residents of the road, who would have explained the very valid concerns, they may have revised some, if not all, of the plans. 
that's the end of the statement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Simmons. So, sorry to be clear, you're not speaking yourself at this stage, but the reason for stepping off the committee is predetermination because you already voted with the Parish Council. Fab, I've got it at last, thank you. Okay. Questions, the officer. Councillor Bromley. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I just ask, that, um, from what I understand, the, um, the parking will be at the front of the property? Yes, that's correct. I'll just go back to the block plan. There you go. So this, yeah, this here is three spaces uh, to the front of the property which are proposed. That's policy compliant for the number of bedrooms uh, which will result after the development. Thank you. So there isn't the intention to use the back lane then as a kind of like a, a parking area. I mean, the parking will be at the front. Yeah, so the, the garden room, oh, sorry, let me, there we are. So the garden room does propose a garage as, as part of it, and you can actually see on the elevation drawings there is a garage door. This, this garage space isn't policy compliant. It doesn't have the sufficient internal um, dimensions for, for a vehicle to be parked within it. However, d d to refuse it on that basis, we think would be, would be difficult, be challenging. People can use their garages you know, for, for the storage of, kind of household items and not everybody parks their cars in them. So through, throughout the application, it was revised to include an additional parking space to the front uh, to ensure that there is parking for three vehicles at the site to ensure that it is policy compliant. Um, it's my understanding that the lane to the rear is, is a private lane and, and people do park, park their cars there. Um, but there, there wouldn't be any other uh, space for the applicant to park within, within their curtilage, really, apart from these three properties, uh, these three parking spaces, sorry, at the front, which are now proposed. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Romney. Anybody else got any questions for the officer? Councillor Jackson. Um, thank you. The site visit was really very useful, but I'm still a bit confused um, where the back boundary of the property lies. It looks to me like they're bringing the development forward a little bit to lie in line with some of the other properties in the lane which were built right up to the boundary I noticed and there wasn't parking space at the back and this proposal would actually build build over the space they've got for a vehicle, if, if I'm not mistaken. And what is exactly in that garden room? So, in terms of the parking, at the moment, the property's got this, this driveway at the front, which you could get two vehicles vehicles on fairly, fairly, fairly easily. Um, however, obviously, they're extending to the side and out the front um, and in the loft, so they need an additional parking space. Uh, to the rear, at the moment... This is the arrangement. So this is not this. This isn't considered by officers to be a formal parking space at the moment. Obviously, you know, you you may or may not be able to park a car there at the moment, but it's not it's not a formal parking space. The proposed development will bring the garden room. I mean, it would just be set back a little bit. You can see on the site plan actually, it's probably better um, for, from the rear. But yes, it would mean that they wouldn't be able to park in the rear lane within within the curtilage of their property. And this is why we have secured an additional parking space to the frontage uh, to ensure that they have a policy compliant number of spaces for the bedrooms proposed. Sorry, was there another question that you had? I'm afraid I forgot. I'm sorry, what is actually in that garden room? Ah, yes, room? yeah. So, and it's very small, so I do apologise. So this area here is proposed to be the garage area. Uh, there's kind of a studio home office with a, t with a toilet area and then uh, sort of, you know, a, a general garden room for sitting in for, for enjoyment. Um, I have recommended a condition that this remains ancillary uh, to the main dwelling house and that should be within the committee report. Okay. Any more questions from anybody? No? We'll move to the debate then. Uh, Oh, sorry, was that a question, Councillor Hodge, or debate? Yeah, so it's just one extra thought. Would, so would sorry, is that a question? Sorry, it's a question, yeah, actually. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, a question. Would, would a car actually be legally permitted to park in the, in the lane um, by the, the garage that isn't a garage if they, if they wanted to? Um, I mean, the lane, the, the, lane is, the lane is privately owned. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a public road. Um, it's not an adopted highway. So, yes, somebody could 
potentially park park their car there if they wanted to. Um, I mean that would that would prevent access for everybody else in the lane because if if the garden room is being built up to here, obviously then there's just this access way. So I would say it's highly unlikely that somebody would would park their car permanently within this space here. Um, but you know there would be nothing legally stopping somebody doing that if if they wanted to. Okay, right. Councillor Jackson, is this question or debate? Uh, neither. Oh. I, I was wanting to move the officer's recommendation. Okay, so we're, in, we're into debate then. Yeah, um, carry on. <laughs> well, I, I can't see it. I, I shouldn't be looking at it this way around, but I am a parish council councillor too, and I can't see any legitimate policy reasons why we would object to this. Uh, I don't think it's overdevelopment of the site and I think it's quite compliant and that with the um, modification of parking at the front, I, uh, you know, I mean, okay, it's very nice for children to play in the road, but uh, I used to as a kid, but you, 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 that's not relevant really. Uh, neither is any um, imputed fu in future intention of turning the house into an HMO, that's, that's just not a consideration. So I don't see any reason why we shouldn't support the perfectly well argued officer's recommendations. Okay, thank you, Councillor Jackson. So we have a motion on the table to support the officer's recommendation. Councillor McPhee, are you offering to second that? So proposer, Councillor Jackson, seconder, Councillor McPhee. Any more for the debate, please? Councillor Bromley. Well, just to support the motion, really, that um, there are other dormer willow windows in the street and also side extensions, and um, uh, with the condition on the garden room not being occupied at any time, um, I would support the motion for those reasons. Thank you. Anybody else want to add anything before we go to the vote? No? Okay. So uh, we can go to the vote. The motion we have on the table is to support the officer's recommendation proposed by Councillor Jackson. Seconded by Councillor McPhee. All those in favour? Nine, so that's unanimous. So that's unanimously passed. Thank you, everyone. So it's nearly half past one. So can we restart at ten past two, please? Can everybody back at their tables just before ten past two? Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back.
Okay, um, first item on the agenda this afternoon is Bromley Mountain Stunt and Drew, um, and we have uh, Christian Masters to do the presentation whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the application relates to Bromley Mount. It's for a replacement dwelling. Um, the site's overwashed by the green belt, which is the principal consideration. Um, it should be noted that there has previously been a scheme permitted on the site um, for a replacement dwelling. Um, during the uh, determination of that application, there was negotiation uh, which reduced the scale of the permitted building. Um, officers believe that that building as permitted was not materially larger. Um, so, as you can see, the site is um, pretty much located in open countryside. Um, it is bordered by the wider Kelston Sparks site. This is a view of the site um, circa May 2020. Um, as you can see, the uh, former building um, is right in the middle of that picture. Um, so it, is reasonably prominent against the skyline, um, but is prominent kind of within the landscape. This is the elevations of the building, um, which was to be replaced. It's now been demolished. And these are the uh, elevations of the extant permission um, as permitted. So as you can see from the pictures, um, these were taken uh, around about a, uh, just over a month ago. Um, the building as permitted um, is now, uh, construction of that building is well underway. And this is the elevations of the building as proposed. As you can see, there's an additional wing on the building. Um, this is, constitutes a, a volume increase of about 32%. Um, over the building previously permitted, uh, which itself was about 5% larger than the, the former building on the site, uh, which has since been removed. Uh, because the building as proposed is materially larger, it's, uh, it's considered to represent inappropriate development within the green belt. Uh, very special circumstances have been suggested uh, by, by the applicant and their agent. Um, these basically constitute uh, environmental benefits from undertaking um, all of the building works proposed um, in, in one go, rather than uh, potentially coming forward with a future scheme um, after consent may be granted. Um, it's not considered that these very special circumstances outweigh the substantial harm, uh, the substantial weight, sorry, which must be given to harm to the green belt, um, and therefore the officer's recommendation is to refuse. Thank you very much. Uh, we have two speakers for this one, if I could have to front please, which are Lee Wright and Councillor Vic Pritchard. Okay, um, timer will start whenever you're ready to start, Mr. Wright, thank you. Good afternoon, councillors. I'm Lee Wright of Wright Consult Limited, agent for the application, and with me today is the applicant, Kelston Stark, who sat behind the chair. Whilst the application before you is for a replacement dwelling, in reality, it is just for the extension, as the house itself has already been approved and is currently being built on site by the applicant as a self-built project. The applicant simply wants to erect the extension at the same time as, the build, as building the dwelling, as this will enable a more energy efficient build in not having to remobilize the plant, equipment, materials and labor, as well as carry out abortive demolition work that would be required if extending at a later date. 
for the avoidance of doubt, the current approved replacement dwelling, which is in build, is the same size as the dwelling in which it replaces, meaning once built, policy would allow an extension. Bathness supplementary planning document existing dwellings in the green belt supports the extension of dwellings with paragraph 7.5 stating, I quote, a well-designed extension resulting in a volume increase of about a third of the original dwelling would be more likely to be acceptable. This accurately describes the proposal before you, which looks to extend the approved dwelling that is already in build by a third, thus policy compliant for an extension. The contention raised by the local planning authority relates to the fact that whilst the local plan policy supports the extension, it does not support that extension until the replacement dwelling is completed, which currently it is not. It seems odd and very much a quirk of policy that the very same resultant dwelling has to be built as two separate elements rather than a single logical and efficient process. However, policy does have its quirks, not at least a similar project I recently undertook for a replacement dwelling in the North Somerset Council area, but only a few miles away, and in the very same Bristol and Bath Greenbelt was permitted with a similar increase, and that's because the North Somerset Local Plan DM44 does allow it. And whilst the real energy savings of building in one efficient process can be debated, it seems illogical in a declared climate emergency to throw away what is otherwise an easy and significant environmental gain. You will note from the recommendation before you that it does not object otherwise to the design and in fact on page 90 recognises how the design limits visual impacts. There are no objections from statutory consultees, there are no objections from neighbours and the parish council support the application. We thank you for your time this afternoon and we respectfully ask if you could consider a positive and common sense approach is taken today so that the extension can be approved now rather than in a few months time when the house is otherwise completed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Pritchard, are you ready? Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman, for allowing me to speak as the ward councillor responsible for calling this particular application to your, your uh, committee. Um, council, in whatever guise, runs by policy. And planning running by policy is imperative so that a fair and even assessment is given to each and every application. But there are instances where policy becomes outdated. And in this particular instance, I would suggest that the policy, although adhered to by the case officer, uh, is, uh, can be overridden in this instance. Uh, it's useful policy in so much as so many of the applications can be dealt with on a delegated matter, but it's because there's an anomaly in this particular consideration, I felt confident in calling it to your, your committee. What it means in effect is that the applicant has got consent to build a replacement dwelling on the former footprint of what stood there before. The applicant also wants to extend that as they would be permitted within the confines of the guidance in, in this instance in the green belt where they can add up to a third. Now, if I mean, it's been suggested to me, if this is dealt with on two separate uh, uh, applications, he's been, the applicant's been successful on the first occasion and a subsequent application for the extension it's been suggested to me would be successful. But the policy we have at, at the moment in this authority is such that it has to be by a process of two applications. It cannot be done in one. What, what the applicant is requesting in this instance, this instance that it is done in one, and it seems only sensible to do that, that the, if you go through the processes as the policy determines, you do it in two, it will be successful. Why not do it in one? Because if you complete the, the dwelling as it is at the moment, then the applicant's successful on the second occasion, he will have to demolish 
probably a quarter of that dwelling to accommodate the attached extension. Now that seems unreasonable, a little bit ridiculous when we're looking at the, the benefits of implementing every measure we can to address the challenges of climate change. You're asking a building to be completed, demolish it, new materials, some of those materials would be wasted, and also two measures of all of those su supports to build that dwelling have to return to the site after a, a couple of months, perhaps. So what I'm suggesting and asking and requesting of this, this committee is in this instance, before there's a revision of the policy, to something that equates with our neighboring authorities, in this instance, consent's given for the whole works to be carried out as one development. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you'd like to return to the seats behind me. Any questions, please, to the officer, Councillor Jackson. I'm afraid I've got rather confused, not for the first time by Councillor Pritchard, but anyway, um, the question is, we have an extant planning permission for the building which is currently going up. They want to modify this by adding an extension. Are we considering just the extension or are we taking this as a completely fresh application which for some reason requires, if it were completed, a quarter of it to be removed in order to fit the extension on? And what I wondered if the officer could also enlighten us. Um, it is already over the limit for a green belt building, <coughs> which is constricted by the 1948 legislation. Um, how much volume is this extension going to add on it? Uh, well, in terms of what the application is for, the application is for a replacement dwelling um, in its entirety. Um, it's been assessed against uh, the provisions of the National Planning Policy Framework um, and local policy accordingly. Um, the relevant policy is policy CP8, um, which links directly back to the MPPF, uh, which was last updated in 2021. Um, that's national planning policy and says that replacement buildings within the green belt um, shall not be materially larger. Um, I would suggest that that policy is very much um, in date uh, obviously having been refreshed within the last, uh, within the last year. Um, in terms of the volume, it, it, it's not uh, necessarily relevant um, in terms of the size of the building um, which has been replaced. Um, the, the policy is just whether it's materially larger than that building, um, which in, in this instance, what is being proposed is uh, in, in the region of 32% larger than the building, which has uh, since been demolished. Okay, Councillor Jackson, to answer your question. Anybody else? Go, oh, Councillor Davis, sorry. Uh, can I just, could an application for an extension have been made while this one is being built rather than a new house? If the application for an extension is gonna come forward, um, Normally, that would come as a householder application, uh, which would need to be submitted once the house has been completed. Councillor Hughes. Thank you. Um, so just, just to clarify, so the applicant has applied three times. They've applied for a property 30% larger than the existing footprint, and three times we've explained to them that that isn't policy compliance. Um, that's correct, is it? That's correct. Okay. And what they seem to be implying is that if after this is built, they were to apply for an extension, we would have no grounds for refusal. Is that correct as well? That's incorrect. We would have to assess any future application on its own merits. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? I have a question, just to clarify again. The 30% um, larger than allowance will always be against the original building that was on that site, is that correct? The th in terms of a, 
I, th I think there's a little bit of confusion here between 30%, which um, is a guide within the SPD, which relates to a, a different exception uh, for development within the MPPF, uh, which relates to um, the extension of an existing building. The, the form of development that's being proposed is a replacement building, and the provision with the MPPF for replacement buildings is that they shouldn't be materially larger. Um, so previously, we've allowed a building that is 5% larger, um, and we considered that that was not materially larger. The building now proposed is 32% larger, which we are, uh, I, in fact, I don't think uh, between the applicant and, and the uh, council there's any dispute that it's materially larger. It's, it's whether there's very special circumstances to justify uh, the, the harm that is su uh, subsequently caused to the Greenbelt. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hodge. Yeah, so I think what um, Councillor Craig was asking, what I'd like to understand as well, is the, so you have permission to build something that is around about 5% bigger than the original, a replacement, it's almost the same size. If they come back for, uh, uh, with a separate application for an extension, that the 30% the rule or third rule applies. So 5% of all that has already been offered up in terms of it, it, what they're building now is 5% bigger than the original, is, is the question. So, so the, anyway, it, it would be a separate application and around about 25% would be allowed. Is that right? I understand the question. Um, so the 30% would be taken from the building, uh, the original building as permitted, um, which in this case would be uh, the building uh, let's go back. So on the, on the scheme which has already been permitted, uh, a addition uh, which is in the region of about a third larger uh, than the, the dwelling on the screen um, would generally be considered to be policy compliant, um, obviously subject to um, other material considerations. Okay, any more questions? No? We move to the debate then, Councillor Hansel. Um, this is slightly bizarre, isn't it? Because uh, Councillor Pritchard has made a, a, a very good explanation of, of why he considers the current policy uh, inadequate and that there should be a change of policy. But we're not a policy making group. Uh, our only role is to check compliance against existing policies. And whatever we think of the existing policies, that's our only role. And uh, clearly, this, um, uh, the, the officer's got it absolutely right uh, that there's no way that we can permit this under existing policies. Thank you. Any more contributions to the debate, please? Councillor Jackson. Well, I thought Councillor Hanslow was going to make a recommendation, but I'll recommend uh, that we accept the officer's uh, recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Do you have a seconder for uh, that? I'll second Councilor that. Hounsell. Anybody else like to contribute to the uh, debate? Councillor Bromley. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I, ca I can't see that uh, very special circumstances have been proven at all in this case. So, so yes, I, I, I would support the officer's recommendation. Anybody else? Anything to say before we go to the vote? No? So, um, motion is on the table to support the officer's recommendation. Proposer, Councillor Jackson, seconder, Councillor Hansel. All those in favour? Ten in favour, so that's unanimous. Thank you. So, that motion is carried. Right, so we need to change of officer. Give them a couple of minutes. Okay, are you ready, Isabel? Do you want to do your presentation? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. 
So this, yeah, this application is for the replacement of the building's east facade, uh, facade at King Edward's School in Bathwick. So this is site location plan. This is the entire uh, area of the school. And again, shown here on an aerial. The site actually relates to a very small area, just one elevation of a uh, Q block of the property. So this is a bit more zoomed in, so you can see Q block here and the facade which we're talking about outlined in red. So these are the existing proposed elevations. This is the existing, and this is the proposed. It's quite difficult to see um, <laughs> all the differences on there, but essentially the windows at the moment are single glazed. Uh, it's proposed that these will be upgraded to double glazing. Um, there's some changes to the uh, panelling, which at the moment I think is a light blue colour and will be light grey, and then there's some vents here and then here on all the other, all the windows, um, which will allow for uh, a ventilation system to be installed. So this is the photo of uh, the south elevation of the building, which has actually already been upgraded. So in terms of appearance, it will look relatively similar to this. I think it's quite helpful. It's quite difficult to see on the uh, elevation drawings, the changes. And this is the existing building. Uh, apologies, the, the courtyard area where it is is quite small, so it's not it's not the clearest, but these are the single glazed windows up here and on the bottom, and again, you can see the poor state of repair of the, of the frames in this photo a bit better. Uh, and again, the existing windows, and then just a slightly wider shot of, of the existing facade. Uh, so the application is recommended for permission for the reasons in the committee report. Thank you very much. Uh, we have no speakers on this one, and uh, just this, I believe this has come before committee because the applicant is a councillor, is that correct? So, no speakers. Do we have any questions from anyone? Uh, Councillor Hodge. I'm sorry, I forgot, Chair, I forgot to mention a pecuniary interest, so I need to stand down, actually, because I'm a parent at the school. So, I think uh, I probably okay. need to leave the room. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody got any questions for the officer? No? Okay, we'll move to the debate. Councillor Hounsell. Uh, I propose that we accept the officer's recommendation to permit. Thank you. Do we have a seconder, Councillor Jackson? Anybody got anything else they would like to contribute to the debate? No? We'll go to the vote then. So the motion we have on the t table is to support the officer's recommendation, opposed by Councillor Hounsell, seconded by Councillor Jackson. All those in favour? Nine in favour, so that's unanimous. That's unanimously carried. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so we're moving on to Dirty Grange, Cainsham. Um, when you're ready, Isabel. Thank you, Chair. So yes, this, this application is for the erection of an outbuilding um, at Durley Grange in Canesham. So this is the existing site location plan. This is the main building of Durley Grange here. Here you've got the Canesham bypass, which you can see in this aerial photo here. And then this is the uh, existing railway line. Uh, the property for reference in the aerial photo is here. So these are the existing proposed site plans. So as existing, there's a structure in the garden shown here, an existing uh, kind of garage built area here. And then here is proposed the uh, outbuilding at the edge of the site. Again, the Canesham Bypass is located here, Durley Lane along the front here. So this is the existing uh, site plan. You've got what's called to be a garage here and then the boundary wall and steps leading up into the garden with the section drawing which shows this as well. So as proposed, the building will have uh, two levels. Uh, level one, which is access from uh, Durley Lane, will incorporate a garage, fuel and solar battery store. And then the second floor, we've got a garden room, uh, again, storage, plant, uh, treatment room. So the proposed elevations, 
got the south elevation here, which faces uh, sort of into the into the garden of the property. This is the side elevation with the garage door, which fronts onto Durley Lane, and then the rear and other side elevation at the bottom. So some site photos. This is as you approach down Durley Lane towards the uh, existing dwelling, which is here. The Cainshire Bypass, you can't see it very well in this photo, but it is located, the, the bridge is located at just here. And actually, as you move along the lane, you can again see the bypass just up here. This is the existing uh, structure, which is, which is called a garage. And you can see that a little bit better there. And again, just a view, um, this here is the main dwelling house at Dilly Grange. This is the existing annex building, which was granted permission some years ago. And then some photos which <coughs> are taken by the applicant. These are from within the uh, property. So this, is a, this is facing where the, uh, where the building is proposed to be uh, located. Again, you can see the bypass through the trees with the traffic on it up here. And this is just a view of the existing uh, annex building. So the application is recommended for refusal for the reasons outlined in the officer report. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Simmons, you're stepping down because you've already expressed a view on this at Parish Council, is that right? But you were going to speak. Okay, so you're speaking on behalf of someone else. Would you like to go to the front? We've got another speaker as well. But yeah, can you go to the front? Yeah, and then if you would leave the room afterwards. Um, Dr. Peter Roberts, please, if you come to the front. So, Councillor Simmons, you're speaking for someone who's against the uh, application, is that right? Yeah, what are you doing? You're speaking as Ward Councillor. You're speaking as Ward Councillor. Yeah, okay. So, if I could have um, Dr. Roberts first, please, when you're ready. That is now live, is it? Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Peter Roberts. I am the applicant. Durley Grange is the only residential property situated adjacent to the A4 Cainton Bypass, below the level of the dual carriageway. No provision was made to screen the road when it was constructed in the mid-1960s. In a recent survey commissioned by this council, air quality issues at this location resulting from the frequent tailback of stationary traffic between Hicksgate and the bridge over Durley Lane were highlighted. The proposed outbuilding, in addition to creating a much needed garage, garden room, garden equipment and garden furniture store, will provide significant environmental benefits for me and my family by reducing the incremental visual, acoustic and airborne traffic pollution that we are subject to. It will also provide our only south-facing roof suited for the installation of solar panels. The openness of the Greenbelt at this location has already been irreparably damaged by the large modern office block that overlooks and dominates the site and the cast concrete A4 bridge spanning Durley Lane. Rather than detracting, the proposal aspires to enhance the visual amenity. By virtue of the steeply sloping site, ground level at the rear of the building is five meters above that at the front. And whilst the building may appear as two stories when viewed from Dirty Lane, it is a single story building. Were the height of the roof limited to four meters, as measured from ground level at the rear, the building would comply with the necessary criteria for it to be deemed a permitted development. However, in order to provide an effective barrier both to screen the road and reduce the downward drift of airborne traffic pollutants, a ridge height of 5.2 meters is required. This equates to the height of acoustic barriers as specified by Highways England, were these to be erected on the side of the dual carriageway. The small increase in height that is sought, namely 1.2 meters, is the sole reason why planning permission is necessary. By employing fully integrated solar tiles, to construct the south-facing element of the main roof, a peak generating capacity of seven kilowatts can be achieved. 
This will be used to power a heat pump to replace the gas-fired boiler in the annex and to charge our two existing electric cars. Professor Frank Kelly, an acknowledged expert on traffic pollution, has studied my proposal. He concluded, and I quote, there is an irrefutable case for this application to be approved on account of the building effectively serving the dual purposes of mitigating air pollution health impacts as well as enhancing the environmental credentials of the property. Now in my 80th year, I spend an increasing amount of time tending my garden, which is 3.5 meters below and within 33 meters of a very busy dual carriageway. The benefits of this proposal for the peaceful enjoyment of my home and garden, my future health, and that of my extended family are clearly obvious. In concluding, I seek only to follow the example set by this council in its core strategy in addressing both traffic pollution and climate change. On account of the very special circumstances that are specific to this site, I would urge you to approve my application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Simmons, when you're ready. I, I don't think I can add anything to that. The only thing I can say is that um, the family has suffered from the, f the pollution to the extent that um, one of his grandchildren was born with diabetes type 1, which is directly attributable to traffic pollution. From, and it's in the paper by Dr. Kelly. I think that's correct. And I, haven't, I can't follow that. He said, Peter has said everything that he needs to say. And it is a special case. It's a unique case of, of um, green belt, in the green belt. There is nowhere else in the whole of Baines which is built 30 metres away from a dual carriageway with a concrete overbridge to look at. It will actually improve the visual aspect of, of, from the view from the playing fields at Broadlands. And you, the openness of the green belt has been already been damaged by the MOD building, the Babcock building behind. So it's actually an improvement, and I think it will make the family and everybody that lives along that road, it'll, it'll improve their lot because it'll reduce pollution by not allowing the drift of the uh, fumes from the traffic buildup, which is getting worse, um, in fact, in their lives. I, I have the same problem at the top of the road where I live. We get Sometimes we get 90 milligrams of nitrogen dioxide per you know, M3 um, when traffic builds up and it doesn't go away. You can taste it and it affects everybody. I think this is an improvement to the area and it will improve the, the visual demeanour of Durley Lane. So that's all I've got to say. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Okay, questions to the officer. Councillor McPhee. Um, how, how do you respond to the argument that the uh, putting the building there will shield the people in the garden, etc., from uh, the fumes of the, of the um, traffic? Yeah, so uh, I have discussed this in, in my report. There's, there's no dispute that, you know, the, the positioning of, of the dwelling in, in relation to the bypass will cause noise air pollution. Um, however, it's considered that the positioning of a building uh, to screen it may provide some visual screening. Um, however, that's not seen as a, a, a... Improving visual immunity in this way isn't seen as a very special circumstance. Um, in terms of the noise and air pollution, I, it, it's my view that it hasn't been... Uh, dem successfully demonstrated that positioning a building in this way would reduce air and noise pollution for for the uh, occupants. Um, you know, it, it, it's not it's not an acoustic fence. Um, there's been nothing in kind of in terms of the distances, etc., that would be required, and, and what impact it would have on the noise levels in terms of rela uh, reduce, reducing that significantly. So, in in my view, um, positioning the building there wouldn't address those those matters um, you know in a, in a sufficient way that that means that this could be considered very special circumstances uh, but again that is a matter for the committee to decide sorry follow-up so in a sense you're 
uh, against the expert, right? Um, I mean, the evidence that's been provided as part of the application, in my view, isn't, it, it doesn't really provide anything which uh, persuades that the positioning of a building is absolutely necessary. I mean, the, func the primary function of the building in my view, is not to provide air and noise pollution reduction. It's to provide the building, and as a byproduct of that, it may have some impact on the noise and, and air pollution. However, you know whether, whether or not a building is, is the most efficient way of doing that is, is you, know, you know, I have queried that in my report. I think the, what the committee have to make a judgment on is, is whether there are very special circumstances here that the building does does sufficiently address those matters and therefore you know can that can outweigh the, the harm to the green belt which should be given significant weight in any consideration okay councillor mcphee councillor jackson i i am deeply disturbed by this application i have never heard or never seen or never read anything that implies that type 1 diabetes uh, is affected, well, is caused by, I think he said, uh, air pollution. And, and, but in any case, as far as we know, the uh, family, the grandchild is not resident on the site. So um, I think we should disregard all that. Um, and I, I can't quite get my mind around the logic of constructing a garden room or office or, or whatever it's going to be used for so close to the bypass when you would your sort of natural instinct you would have thought would have been to have any sort of extension like this as far away from possible as possible I mean is, is it not going to be the case that whoever is using that building is going to be exposed to a high level of uh, pollution um. I'm not an expert on air, air pollution in terms of proximity uh, to to traffic, um, so I, you know, I can't say say whether or not being in closer proximity in terms of whether the room is uh, located would cause more harm or not. But this is the application before us. Okay, Councillor Bromley. Thank you, Chair. Um, Yes, I, I, f I feel a bit confused really because um, this this extension, this outbuilding really, is to form um, a garage, garden room, and storage area. I can't understand really how that's going to help uh, reduce exposure to to pollution because it's not it's not a dwelling, new dwelling house, is it? It's a it's a sort of like an, an outbuilding. So, but that is the intention, isn't it? It's not not um, it's it's really a, a garden room. Is that is that right? Yeah, I'll just go back to the floor plans there we go so yeah it's split over two levels you've got the level on the uh, which will be accessed from Durley Lane which is a garage uh, fuel and solar battery store and then you've got the level above which is at the garden level so you've got the garden garden room and, and garden furniture store area here uh, a garden equipment store uh, and plant room for sewage treatment system in here and then uh, garage fuel and battery store below this area um, so yes, it's over two levels as the elevation drawings again for you. Okay, do we have any more questions from anyone? Councillor Davis. Yeah, could you just go back to the plan to show how close this proposal is to the actual edge of the road? I think one of the pictures implied maybe the angle it was taken at that it's not quite at the edge, although on there it's obviously quite close. Like yeah, so this is the site location plan with the... Um, proposed building mark here and this this is the bypass now this part of the bypass is raised uh, so it's on it so it's on the bridge so it's o it runs over Durley Lane which runs under here um, I'll just go through so the building will be positioned roughly roughly here at the edge of the site and this here is the bypass bridge which you can just about see we could just go in a bit closer so this would be where the edge of the building would be and then this is the bridge here. Um, so it is it is around 30 metres, I think, from memory. I haven't, I haven't measured it recently. Um, but hopefully that helps. OK, any more questions from anyone? Councillor Hughes. So yes, could, could you just confirm what the applicant said, that this would be within permitted development if we were to reduce the height by 1.2 metres? Um, I actually don't agree with that, uh, because 
uh, permitted development for outbuildings for any building which is within uh, two metres of the boundary of the curtilage of the dwelling house. The maximum height uh, is actually 2.5 metres. The um, general permitted development order can be quite confusing on that because it has different heights for outbuildings for the type of the roof. And one of those is that a mono pitch roof um, or sorry, dual pitch roof can have a maximum height of four metres, but that is superseded by the fact that if it's located within two metres of the boundary, it can't go above 2.5 metres in height. Uh, that is measured from the highest ground level. Um, I, haven't, I haven't obviously measured what could be done under permitted development. Nothing's come forward for me to sort of assess, um, but my understanding you know, is that that would be the maximum height measure from the ground level. Obviously, I haven't been out of sight. You can see it's a stepped site, so that may have some bearing on that. Okay, Councillor Jackson. Well, obviously, the officer has recommended refusal, and I'm rather inclined to think she's right, but were we to vote the other way, we would need a condition that this was ancillary to the main house, wouldn't we? So... Um, yes, I would agree with that. I think that that would be something that could be recommended. Any more questions? No, we'll move to the debate then. Councillor Hope. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, right, I, th I think um, it's important to uh, consider the application sort of holistically that, that the intention obviously uh, as explained by the applicant is uh, there are a number of purposes. Uh, reference has been made to the uh, unusual uh, lie of the land. Um, you have the very steep slope in front of you where you've got the bypass. Laterally you have a very steep slope and as has been explained uh, the um, uh, the, the garden, etc., are on different levels. Um, uh, I have visited um, in the past, and it is a very uh, s sort of unusual, very unusual um, uh, 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 sort of layout. Uh, and that's why I'm going to propose a, a, a site visit. I think without a site visit, it'd be difficult to be uh, completely fair to the applicant. Uh, or to uh, see uh, the validity of any objections. So I'm proposing a, a site visit. Thank you, Councillor Hansel. Can we have anyone to second that? Councillor McPhee. Um, so before we go to vote on that, can I ask if anyone's got anything further to contribu contribute to the debate about the site visit specifically? No. Okay, so we'll go to the vote on the site visit then. Um, so the motion on the table to have the site visit um, proposed by Councillor Hounsell, seconded by Councillor McPhee. All those in favour? Five in favour. And against? Four against. And that's our total, isn't it? Because we only have... Yeah. So that is carried. So that will be a site visit. Um, right, so, uh, Councillor, you're stepping out for this one. Could you get Councillor Simmons back, please? Wait for a moment for Councillor Simmons. Okay, so this is another one that's in front of us because uh, it's the applicant's councillor, Councillor Hodge, who's stepped away from the committee. Um, if you're ready for your presentation, please. Thank you, Chair. Yes. Um, this is actually, a, this agenda item also relates to a no, uh, notice for tree works in the Bath Conservation Area. Um, so it's not a planning application, um, and it's, but it has obviously been brought to you um, because of um, the councillor as the applicant. Um, it relates to four trees um, at uh, Audley House. Um, this is a site location plan and an area plan outlining the um, actual uh, curtilage of the property. It relates to two, uh, 
two cedars. Uh, one's on the right-hand side of your um, uh, aerial photograph near to the lane, um, and uh, the other one, you can just about see the, um, uh, the red circle um, heading back. Those two are two cedars, and um, they, the work is purely to remove some broken limbs following the recent storms. Um, this relates to a, a small cherry beside the property, uh, which is to be removed, and uh, Italian cypress, which is to the rear, um, tucked around the back of um, uh, all the trees here, uh, which is also to be removed. The purpose of the notice is um, to determine whether um, uh, a tree preservation order should be made or not, um, so a site visit was made. Um, I'm hoping that this photograph shows uh, there's a couple of long stubs here um, where some branches have been failed and there, there's no foliage left on those. Um, so uh, the intention is to, to take those back uh, closer to the trunk, but uh, based on best practice pruning. This is the little cherry by the house um, and that, the intention is to be uh, removed. Um, that can't readily be seen from the, the public domain. This blue atlas cedar, this is, this is actually a hung up branch. Um, probably can't necessarily see that so easily there, but uh, it, it's, it's overhanging the garden, but um, it's not in an area of um, intensive use. Um, so um, uh, they, they've included the removal of this uh, as best practice. Uh, this Italian cedar, you can see that um, it's suffering from quite a lot of dieback here. Um, and that's a second view of it. Um, there is scattered foliage um, that's yellowing around it. It's consistent with Corinium canker. I uh, don't envisage that this tree will recover. Um, there is actually, what's not shown here, is that um, the uh, stem divides further up where the arrow is, if you can see that. Um, and that actually um, moves quite significantly in the wind. Uh, there is a suspicion that there either has been a failure or there might be a failure at that point. Um, and a decision was made that it would be inappropriate to make um, a tree preservation order, so the officer recommendation is to raise no objection to the works. Thank you. Thank you very much. There are no speakers for this one. Do we have any questions? Councillor Jackson. Uh, yeah, I'm a bit worried. Um, this has come to the committee because it's a councillor's estate. Does this mean that in future, if any of us put in um, an application for tree works, that it'll come here? I believe that's uh, what our uh, democratic, um, our, our legal situation is now in terms of delegation. Yeah, uh, councillor applications or members of the committee applications and officer applications uh, come to the committee for the purposes of transparency. Well, I mean, I have to confess, I've had three consents to tree works in my back garden without it ever going anywhere beyond Bradstock Town Council. But aren't we in a conservation area here? That's the difference. Obviously, I'm not familiar with the um, tree works applications that you've had, um, but I can only explain that the delegated the scheme of delegation does require that um, councillor applications, uh, certainly members of the committee council applications and officer applications uh, who are connected with the planning service are reported to this committee. Um, so I can't really comment on anything that's been before or the specifics of any applications that you've had. Um, we identify those applications through the application forms um, where uh, there is a, usually a box where you can identify that you are uh, connected with the planning service. Yeah, I think what I was saying was that if, if Councillor Jackson's property isn't in an area where the trees are, it's a conservation area, perhaps, then there wouldn't have needed to have been an application. So, No, but apologies. Yes, for clarity, if no planning application or tree works application was required, then it would not need to be reported because you wouldn't have ne needed the um, council's consent. 
You're still looking perplexed, Councillor Jackson. Well, I usually tick all the right boxes. Yeah, no, I think, I, I, I think you're okay. Any more questions? No? Okay, then we'll move to the debate and I'll invite Councillor Bromley as the ward councillor to open the debate. Um, I'd like to propose that we accept the officer's recommendations for the reasons set out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Jackson. Thank you. So, the motion on the table is to support the officer's recommendation, proposed by Councillor Bromley, seconded by Councillor Jackson. All those in favour? Nine in favour. Unanimous. So that's unanimously passed. Sorry. Item 9 on the agenda, appeals reports. Do members have any questions or comments on the appeals report? Councillor Jackson. Um, yes, as usual, we've had a very good result from our officers. Um, but what I was wondering, page 123, um, Resourceful Earth Limited, which we may remember this debate quite uh, vividly, um, it says appeal withdrawn. Is your mic on? Oh, yes, it is. Oh, sorry, can you okay. hear me now? Uh, not very loudly, but carry on. Right, I was oh, wondering, since the appeal has been withdrawn, whether we're going to proceed to enforcement action on this application of the Resourceful Earth Limited with its um, buildings that we noted didn't have planning permission. If, if Councillor Jackson and any other members of the committee would like, we, I can ask um, the enforcement manager to uh, comment on that and provide you with any details in relation to that um, subsequent to this committee, or we can report it back to the committee if you'd like to do that. So, which would be easier, just for the sake of the minutes? Uh, for the sake of the minutes, if, if you'd like us, we could just report back to yourselves after the committee. And, um, that would be fine. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else got any comments or questions on the appeals report? No. So, date of next meeting, uh, Wednesday, 4th of May. We do have a site visit, which will be on Monday, the 25th of April, if you could put that in your diaries. Um, thank you very much, everybody. I'll close the meeting now.